come to order. I'd like to call your attention to a piece of paper on your <clears throat> desk in front of you. We'd like to poll the convention in regards to your feelings on <clears throat> who you, your personal preference for the nominee of the Democratic Party is concerned. Uh, as President of the United States is concerned, rather, you'll find a ballot that we fixed up on each table. We'd like to, for each delegate to mark that <clears throat> before he leaves today and turn it over to the sergeant at arms. We'd like to see your feelings on this important matter before you leave this convention. This morning, we're privileged to have with us to <clears throat> bring the invocation the Reverend R.M. Matheny, Jackson District Superintendent of the United Methodist Church here in, Jack in Mississippi. I understand that Brother Matheny, as an old-time friend of our Secretary Treasurer, and that he might have a few interesting remarks to make about him before he leaves the podium. Gives me a great deal of pleasure, pleasure to present to you the Reverend Matheny. Thank you, Mr. Ramsey. I would like to remind you that uh, you are very fortunate to have uh, in your midst Mr. Thomas Knight, whom I've known since 1939. He was uh, a very, very young fellow then and still claims this, but I want you to know that uh, I consider any group fortunate to have the kind of leadership that this man is giving, and I am honored today by the privilege of being here with you fine people of uh, the purposes for which you strive, I share with you deep in my heart, and I would ask uh, as we pray together the, the blessings of God Almighty upon this meeting. Let us pray. And now, Father, in thy presence we realize that we are thy children, made in thine image with the responsibilities of decision-making. We pray we might take this seriously as we realize that we are answerable to the Almighty for our decisions, and we might make them in the light of the very best knowledge we have and the best divine guidance that is available unto us all. From the directions these people have come, as they have worked together, the accomplishments that have been theirs, we do humbly give thee our thanks. We express our gratitude as Americans for what has happened as people have worked together to, to help people as they have sought to bring to pass in the lives of people human dignity and the rights that we cherish. And so we pray this morning that the deliberations of this body shall be guided more particularly by thy holy presence, that we shall be able to measure ourselves by what we know to be right, and we might remember the prophets of old who said, What doth the Lord require of us but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God? This purpose, our Father, intermingled with the purposes of this meeting and of the ideals of these people, we humbly place before thee as the altar people of old did in the name of the one who made us all, and who loves us and would guide us every step that we take in life. And when these people depart and go their separate ways, watch between us while we are absent one from another, bind us together with the cords that bind people with good purposes in mind, and bring us together on many occasions in spirit and in purpose, we do humbly pray as our Heavenly Father watches over us in his name. Amen. Thank you, uh, Reverend Matheny. We appreciate your presence here this morning, as well as your timely remarks. On behalf of the delegates at this convention at this time, I'd like to present to you a Bible. I should advise your guests that Bishop Brunini yesterday commented that he didn't think I wrote that book, and I want you to understand I didn't author the one that you have either. 
We do appreciate your presence. You're invited to spend the rest of the day with us uh, if your schedule permit. But if you have to leave, we'll understand why. <clears throat> I'm sure that most of the delegates present are familiar with the fact that <clears throat> the AFL-CIO <clears throat> has recently restructured itself, uh, that there has been a consolidation of regions and what have you. And today we have the new regional director for this region with us, as well as the retired regional director who is also on the podium. And as you'll note, we have a number of prominent uh, people here on the podium this morning, uh, not only to be here while Jim Sala delivers his address, but to also be here in honor of the retired or retiring regional director, Robert Starnes, who I think most of you know. Jim Sala has been with us the last couple of days. We've had an opportunity to sit down and talk with him quite at length. And I can advise you here today that, uh, that he has advised me <clears throat> that his office and his staff is available to this organization to work with us and our central labor councils in any way that uh, we need them. Jim, it's a pleasure to have you with us this morning. Without any further ado, it gives me a great deal of pleasure to present to you Brother Jim Sala. Thank you, Claude. Mr. President, guests, delegates, brothers and sisters, it's an honor for me to be here at your convention, not just to have the opportunity to say a few words with, to you, with you, but to congratulate you and your officers on building the labor movement in the state of Mississippi. I'm a transplanted snowbird. I come from up north. And up there, it's very easy to be a good union member. It's fashionable. We don't have the right to work law. When you go into a plant that's organized, everybody becomes a member. The boss is not constantly trying to break the union. And we have a lot of good union members there because it's very easy to be a good union member. But I've found since I've come down south that it takes a lot of intestinal fortitude to be a good union member in these seven states, which I'm privileged to be the director in. And I have a lot of admiration for you people, and I thought that I'd say that before I get into some of my remarks. Because I have that admiration, I've torn up my 27-page speech on the economy. You've heard about the economy from a lot of former speakers, and I'm sure you're going to hear more about the economy. We all know that we're in a vicious crossfire of rising prices, high unemployment. We're being zapped with high taxes, high interest rates. And our friends in Washington, it reminds me of a, of a little story. Uh, at a Boy Scout meeting, each Boy Scout has to get up and say what he or <coughs> Girl Scouts also, what they're doing, uh, a good deed for the day. And as the little fellas and little gals get up and report, each one of them tells about their good deed. And the one little fella gets up, and he sort of had a rough time trying to find something nice to do that day. So when they ask him, he says, well, I saw an elderly couple running for a bus. And I could see that they weren't going to make that bus. So I had my two hunting dogs with me. And I sicked my dogs on that elderly couple so they could catch that bus. <laughs> well, it sort of reminds me of what's happening in Washington. We're chasing inflation, and our good friends in Washington have sicked the dogs of unemployment, high interest rates, and now a surtax to help us catch up with inflation. We certainly don't need that kind of help. I'd like to talk about my subject, organizing. There are a lot of unorganized people in this country, some 35 million of them. And I'll restrict my remarks to the some eight and a half million organizable but unorganized workers in the Southeast region, Region 5. Unorganized. Are they unorganized because they don't want to be or organized? 
Are they unorganized because we haven't went out to tell them the benefits of organization? There's a lot of different uh, theories on that. And as Claude has mentioned, we have restructured our organization. And in this region, and my deputy director is sitting behind me, so I'm sure if I say something I'm not supposed to say, I'll hear about it later. But I've sort of got some ideas, and I need a lot of help. And I thought that I would take this opportunity to come before your august body and humbly request that kind of help. But before I ask for that help, I'd like to lay out a program in which I would like each and every delegate here and each and every union member and each and every one of their family to become a part of that team. These eight and a half million unorganized workers in our region, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, Florida, Tennessee, and the Carolinas, they're people like us. They're not any special kind of people. They don't work in any special kind of jobs. They hold the same type jobs that our present union members hold. They have the same problems, more so because we do have our collective bargaining contracts to help us at least stay close to inflation. But these people have nothing. Why aren't we organized? Why don't they come to us? I think it's because we haven't asked them. I think it's because each and every one of us in this room haven't rededicated ourselves to building not only a labor movement, but as our adversaries say, in pursuit of our selfish interest. We have selfish interests as union people. Let me outline to you what those selfish interests are. We want to send our children to good schools. We want them taught properly. We want medical care for our families. We want housing, not only for our union members, but for all working people. And I say that these selfish interests are honorable selfish interests. And we shouldn't back away when people say, well, like our incumbent president says that it would be a legislative monopoly if we elect good, responsible people that are going to be responsive to the needs of working people. And I think we should stand up proudly, yes, even in the state of Mississippi, and say that we do have selfish interests, and elaborate them, and elaborate the things that the labor movement has done across the country, establishing a school system, establishing social security, establishing our social justices. We should stand up and proudly talk about that. You know, we've sort of went through two stages in organization. Some of you all in this room remember those stages. Back about 40 years ago, the first stage, which I like to call it, is where the people themselves recognize the need for some type of justice. And when the Wagner Act was passed, they organized themselves. After they organized their own particular plant, they went out and helped their fellow workers in another plant organize. This was the first stage, a big do-it-yourself project. And then about some 20 years later, we got affluent. We went out and hired professional representatives, professional organizers. And our union member says, well, now we're paying their dues. Let them do the job. Let the people we're paying do the job. There are a lot of paid professional organizers, but there's not enough. There never will be enough. Some of the unions have expanded their staffs. Some of the local unions large enough have expanded their staffs. But it's still not enough to do that job of organizing the unorganized. Now we're entering the third stage, what I like to call the third stage. We're not really on stage yet. And this has to be a combination of the satisfied customer, the people that I'm looking at, our union members who are enjoying the benefits of collective bargaining have to now involve themselves in the process of organizing our less fortunate brothers and sisters. There was a survey done once by one of our former directors, Jack Livingston, that if each union member spent just an hour a month, just one hour a month, saying something good about their union in church, in a supermarket, sewing circle, a bowling club, 
just one hour a month saying something good about their union, it would be the equivalent of some 13,000 paid organizers. And I think that it's a role that you should be proud to play, one of the satisfied customers. You're enjoying the fruits of collective bargaining. And at the dinner table, we should tell our children what we're gaining from the union, the benefits that are being brought to us, how we have to have the support to fight our legislative battles in the state and on a national level. And that volunteer working with the paid professional are going to have to be the third stage of our organizing team. Those of you who have recently went through an organizing campaign, and I understand there are some local unions here newly represented, can you remember during that organizing campaign when the boss would put out this vicious literature telling you about the outsider, the union booty boys that were going to come in and take your money? Now, that outsider may have lived in the next county, but he was an outsider. Now, the boss may have moved down from, from the cold country, see, but he was a long-time resident. He wasn't an outsider. And they made it stick. Unfortunately, they made it stick. That union guy was an outsider. But think now how the boss would lose this advantage if the guy or the gal in the next plant over the next county line would come over and help that paid professional. And when I say help, I don't mean to, uh, to go full-time organizing. You all have your families, your responsibilities. But an hour a day, an hour a week, an hour a month, just to take your time to go over and maybe help hand out that leaflet. Take your time to maybe make a house call on an unconvinced employee. And just imagine how effective that would be when you would tell that non-union employee, well, I don't work for the union. I'm just a union member. But by God, I know it's that good, and I know that you need it, that I'm taking my time to come tell you about it. Let's get back to the selfish interest again. That organized plant that you're helping to organize would be an asset to you and your community that would help make your central labor council stronger. It would help you elect some people in that community that would be responsive to your needs, which in turn could be an integral part of the state organization when they send out a legislative alert or they need some help in electing a politician and it would help our national AFL-CIO and the policies that which we're attempting to have enacted in Congress. So you do have a selfish interest, because if that boss, Chamber of Commerce, National Association of Manufacturers, can keep unions weak, they keep your local union weak. And how long do you think it's going to be before your boss says, well, now, why should I pay union wages when they're not organizing my competitor down the street? So you have a special interest, a selfish interest. How are we going to help? Claude mentioned a little bit about our restructuring. Effective immediately after the November elections in the seven states which I represent, I'm releasing my staff from their traditional organizing activities to work with the central labor councils to get into those communities, help them bring up their affiliations, as you heard your president mention the other day, some half of the people here in the state of Mississippi are, are riding free. They're not, they don't belong to our organizations, even though they're union members. My staff is going to attend those meetings, assist, not do it for them, assist that Central Labor Council in getting its proper committees formed, do what work we can do for them, help them with their constitutions, help them with affiliations. But we have a selfish interest also. In return for that, we would like to see each one of the 13 central labor councils here in the state of Mississippi to set up an open-end organizing committee. No real work involved with it, but just bring to that central labor council the names of one of your relatives, the names of one of your friends that work in an unorganized plant that would be willing to help organize that plant. We, in turn, will ascertain if there's enough interest there for a campaign. We, in turn, will contact the proper union and attempt to have an international representative sent in. And I just think that with this third stage, with the paid professional, the local union officers, the local union members, the international unions working together <coughs> can do this job. Claude, if it's permissible, I'd like to give a little figure. 
In the state of Mississippi, you're about 12.6% organized of the potential that you can organize. That's still three states better than some of the others in this region. It's not the best. Alabama happens to be the best with about 22%. And I'd like to be able to have an invitation to come back here two years from now and after we've put this plan into effect and see the impact of having the satisfied customer work with those of us who you pay because we're paid employees to do this job. And I think that we can do it. And I'm not going to get off of the podium without telling a little story, and it has to do with communications, and it has to do with our favorite whipping boy, Tom Knight. And I want to emphasize that this is a problem in this is a problem in communications, and then I'll try to relate it. Bob told this story. He said that him and Tom were sitting in a local bar. I'm not going to say house of ill repute. A local bar, sipping some of the local beverage, and uh, a young lady walks in with a terrifically tight pair of pink shorts, pink pants, slacks, whatever they call them. Of course, Bob said, being his age, it didn't bother him at all, but Tom just couldn't keep his head away. He just kept looking and looking and, you know, looking, and finally it became embarrassing, and the young lady looked over and says, you know, can I help you? Is there anything I can do for you? Tom says, well, I'm sitting over here drinking my drink. He says, and just admiring you, he says, and how in heaven's name does one go about getting in a tight pair of pants like that? She says, you can make a real good start by buying me a drink. <laughs> And I think that's a... And I'm sure that's a problem in communications because I'm sure she misunderstood Tom. <laughs> but when we talk to these non-union people, let's, let's make it very clear. Let's tell them the benefits that we enjoy. And we do enjoy benefits. If you don't believe so, look at your non-union worker. Let's tell them about these benefits. Spend a few minutes a day make it a point to tell somebody something good about your union. Maybe it'll stick, and when that organizer gets there, maybe he'll find his job a little bit better, and it'll make your job a little better. And just before I quit, I've told you about the work that we're going to do, and maybe I better tell you some of the people who are going to do it. Uh, Jim Touchstone, our, one of our staff people, Jim, lives in Meridian, Mississippi. You'll be seeing a lot of him. Dan Ory lives in Jackson, Mississippi. Dan? You'll be seeing a lot of him to help you. And I think the person that does the most work in our Jackson office here, Miss Joyce Burst. Joyce? And I don't know how Joe got up on the stage, but I told him the other day, I said, Joe, since you're retired, you look better than our people that are still working. One of our <laughs> retired members, Joe Mullins. But again, as I said when I started out, I ask your help to do the job that we have to do. I think that we're in an honorable profession. I think that the dignity the peace of mind that we bring to our members, the satisfied customers, is well worth the little effort that we put in. I implore you, give us that kind of help so we can help you do the job. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. We appreciate those remarks, and we're certainly are looking forward to working with you and your staff in trying to build a bigger and better labor movement in the state of Mississippi. I've just been handed a note that people that are parked on the frontage road are getting tickets. I should advise you again, I think, that uh, we don't have very much influence down at City Hall these days. Uh, uh, and there's not much we can do about that uh, other than request that you move your automobile. <clears throat> we have a an old-time friend with us this morning, who recently retired, is regional director of this region. And we've asked him to be here this morning to preside over the nomination of officers at this convention. And while we've got him here, we'd like to <clears throat> have a few words to say about him and present him with a couple of gifts and things of that kind. Bob Starnes has been in the labor movement uh, some 31 odd years, I believe. <clears throat> he was, uh, he came into Mississippi in the early days of the Southern Drive with the CIO. 
Uh, he had a lot to do with organizing the shop that Tom Knight came out of. As a matter of fact, I think he's the guy that perhaps organized Tom Knight. And I've asked Tom to come up and to have a few words to say uh, about our former regional director and <clears throat> to present him with a plaque in behalf of this convention. So at this time, I'm going to uh, ask Brother Knight if he'd come up and have a few words to say and present Brother Starnes with, behalf with the plaque. Brother, br Brother Knight. Brother Starnes. Uh. Brothers and sisters, this is a this is a a real honor and a privilege to me. You know, I'm sure most of you that have been around <clears throat> for a while have heard me and Bob Starnes engage in some pretty rugged arguments. <coughs> if we haven't done anything else for a number of years, I think maybe we have at least <coughs> aroused the curiosity of some people <laughs> on occasions as to which one of us is going to strike the other one first or just what was really going to happen. You know, we, we've been known to talk pretty straight to each other, and, of course, that's been going on for some time. But let me back up just a little bit. As Brother Ramsey told you, this guy led the campaign that organized the plant that I came out of. Now, I had been told, and, of course, I had been uh, kind of controversial for a couple of years there, uh, in organizing activities, and I'd been told this guy was in town. And I didn't know anything about what he looked like. <clears throat> so one afternoon as I left the plant, <clears throat> I walked uptown in Hattiesburg, and I saw this guy coming down the street, you know. He was all dressed up in a seersucker suit. It looked like he had money in the bank, corn in the crib, and thought he had sense. <laughs> And uh, based on the description that I had had, uh, it occurred to me that this was that big, bad director of CIO at that time, organizing committee. <clears throat> so I just parked myself on a corner, and I said, well, there's no better time or place to find out. So I says, are you Bob Starnes? He says, yes. And I told him who I was, you know, and give him some of my candid opinions about... Uh, what the situation was down there. And so we, you know, had a, had a friendly conversation. And this was a long time ago. He, was, uh, he wasn't very old, and I was just a kid. And from that time to this, let's <laughs> take it easy. From that time to this good day, 22nd of October, 1974, Robert Starnes has become a household word. Now, he wasn't really exactly a household word at, at, on some occasions, you know. They, they really didn't refer to him as one of the preferences around household for a long time. But I have considered that day and that time a rare privilege in all sincerity in my lifetime. There's where I met a man who had the dedication, who had the ability, who had the commitment to bring the fruits of trade unionism to the unorganized people in Mississippi. And there's been nothing but a very pleasant association and a pleasant working relationship with this good man since that time. And I could go on and on and on, but there's no use in that. So based on that and based on Bob Starnes' unselfish, untiring, endless efforts in behalf of the working people of the state of Mississippi, it is a great honor and a privilege for me at this time, Brother Starnes, on behalf of your friends and your neighbors in the Mississippi AFL-CIO to present this award of appreciation to you and I want to wish you and your wife the very best of everything, and I hope you live to be 200 years old. We're not going to let you have it yet, Bob. I've got a couple of words to say and another uh, present for you. I realize, of course, you're very anxious to respond to the remarks of Tom Knight, and I'm sure you have some real good words for response ready. 
But our executive board felt it would be appropriate at this time for us to express our appreciation to you uh, concerning the high cost of living and the, the uh, pro many problems you've had. We just thought we ought to <clears throat> present you with our check for $100 and let you buy something you think would be good in your retirement. So with that, uh, it gives me a great deal of pleasure to present to you our check for $100. Now, it's my pleasure to present to you the former region director, Robert Starnes, to preside over the nomination of officers at this convention and to make any remarks that he might have on his mind. Brother Starnes. Just a minute. We ain't through with the ceremony yet. I forgot about another very important thing before you start your remarks. Come on up, Don. Brother Don Slayman, who you've heard already, you are representing President Mina's office, has a letter from President Mina that he had also like to read about Brother Starnes. Fortunately, as I came down here, the AFL-CIO saved a 10-cent stamp, and uh, our director, Alan Kistler, asked me to bring this letter to Brother Starnes from uh, George Meany. Dear sir and brother, the occasion of the Mississippi AFL-CIO's presentation to you of a plaque in appreciation for your service to the unions in Mississippi provides me an opportunity of sending this personal note to you. While the presentation from the delegates during the convention marks their appreciation of your service in that state, I know from my personal knowledge of the many contributions you have made to union members and to unorganized workers, not only in Mississippi, but throughout many of the southern states. Your career spans some of the most important developments in that region, and you, of course, played an important role in many of those significant events. Since the merger of AFL and CIO in 1955, your activities have been confined, for the most part, to Mississippi and Louisiana, both as assistant regional director and in the last several years before your retirement as the acting director of the region. Your contribution to the merged labor movement has been of a very high order. Please accept my fraternal best wishes and my hope for you and Mrs. Starnes that your retirement will, provide long, will, be, will prove long and happy that it is well deserved is, of course, an obvious fact. Sincerely and fraternally yours, George Meany, President. Thank you, now, before you take over officially, I've been handed another note, and I assume the president of the Policeman's Union must have sent this one in. He says the police do not want to give any more tickets if the people will will come and move the cars now. <clears throat> I've also been asked to announce, or at least request, that if the delegates will mark those ballots on, the, on their preference of present, pass it down to the end of each table, the sergeant at arms will be picking them up. Okay? Brother Starnes, it's all yours now. <clears throat> President Ramsey, uh, Deputy Director Slayman, Regional Director Sala, platform guests, fellow union members, and ladies and gentlemen. I have seldom in my labor career been at a loss for words but I find myself now out in left field and I don't know what to say. I have enjoyed my work as a representative of labor. I have particularly enjoyed my work in the state of Mississippi where I have made innumerable friends some of those friendships going back 20 and 25 and 30 years. 
because I started moving around in this state in 1943. Not much in 43 during the war, but more and more. And I have often joked about Tom Knight saying that the greatest mistake of my labor career was when I signed him up into the union. But Tom knows, and I think everybody else knows, that a remark of that kind is strictly a joke. Because I think I did a pretty good job getting him into the union. And I think Tom has made a tremendous contribution. I guess the simplest thing I can say is thank you and express my appreciation. It's going to be a little difficult. It's going to take a little adjusting to uh, become accustomed to not seeing my friends as often as I have been seeing them in the past. But just remember one thing, my thoughts and my best wishes are with you at all times. Now, I have been asked to tell a little story or two about Tom or about anybody else I chose. <laughs> if I told you, you'd want to discriminate against them. And I'm going to tell one little story about Tom. I'm going to start off with Tom. And if he looks at me cross-eyed once more, I'll, I'll really turn loose before I get through. And I saw Ms. Knight here before the meeting started. I think she perhaps is in the audience now, and I'm sure she will vouch for the authenticity of this story. A few nights ago, she and Tom were at home, and they were sitting in the den on their sofa. And she reached over and said, Tom, do you remember how you used to play hands with me before we were married? <laughs> yeah. And he reached over and caught her hand, played hands a little bit. And she said, Tom, do you remember how you used to hug me before we got married? Yeah put his arm around her and give her a good squeeze. And she said in a minute, Tom, do you remember how you used to bite me on the earlobe before we got married? Yeah, and he got up and started out of the room. She says, where are you going, Tom? He said, I'm going to get my teeth. <laughs> Tom's a pretty shrewd fella, too. Got to feeling bad one night, and he called his doctor. He said, Doc, how much you charge for a house call? Doctor said, $20. Tom said, all right, I'll meet you down at your office in 15 minutes. <laughs> and then there was a time that Tom decided to cook some steaks outside. And he burnt the dickens out of them. And when he took them in, his wife says, Tom, you burn these steaks. He said, it ought to be all right. I put Vaseline on them as soon as I did. <laughs> and Tom was telling you about the time 25 years or so ago that we stood on that street corner in Hattiesburg, talked about the union. While we were standing there, a funeral procession went by. Of course, I'm a stranger in Hattiesburg, and I don't know anybody hardly. Tom's a native. I said, Tom, who died? He said, I don't know, but I think it was that fellow in that first automobile up there. <laughs> I 
I'm going to try another one on you for size, Tom. When he was a young fella, when he was a young boy, he quit eating. His daddy couldn't get him to eat at all. So I finally took him to the doctor. The doctor talked to him and finally said, Now, Tom, what would you like to have to eat? Tom says, Some worms. So the doctor sent his nurse out and she came back with a whole mess of worms. Tom looked at him and says, I want them fried. <laughs> So the nurse took him in the other room, put him on a little hot plate, and she fried him. She brought him back. Tom said, I don't want all of them. I don't want but one. So the doctor threw them all away but one. Tom says, all right, you eat half. So the doctor cut the, that blasted worm in half, and he, he, he managed to get it down. And he turned to Tom and says, OK, now, you eat it. Tom says, uh-uh, you ate my half. <laughs> I think I'm going to tell one more on him I have told before, but I like it. I don't think I've told it to a convention. And I don't like to tell the same joke twice. But since I won't have much opportunity uh, to work on Tom in the future, I'm going to take advantage of this and tell you this one. If you have heard it before, perhaps you have forgotten it. And if you haven't heard it before, maybe you will enjoy it. When Tom was a young buck of a man, still around home, his father was in the cattle business. And he raised bulls. And he rented his bulls out. So one afternoon, the father didn't feel well. And Tom's younger sister, insisted that father go lay down. She says, I know about the bulls, and I know about the birds and the bees and everything, and if anybody comes and wants any information about the bulls, I can give it to them. So father went and laid down. <coughs> and after a bit, knock, knock, knock on the door, <coughs> and there was a neighbor from down the road. He said, I want to see your daddy. She said, Daddy don't feel good, he's laying down, but I can tell you about the bulls. Now, we've got the best bull we have, we charge $100 for. He's registered, he's guaranteed, and we got the papers on him. He said, I, I, I don't care anything about that, I want to talk to your daddy. He says, well, we got another bull. If that $100 is too much, <coughs> we charge $50. And he's registered, but we don't have any papers on him, but we guarantee him. <coughs> he said, I want to talk to your father. She says, well, if you don't want to spend that much, we've got another bull, and that's $25. <coughs> he's registered, but we don't have the papers, and he's not guaranteed either. He said, listen, I've told you three times I want to talk to your daddy. Your brother Tom's been running around with my daughter, and he's got her in a family way. <laughs> she says, yeah, I reckon you are going to have to talk to daddy, because I don't know what he charges for Tom. <laughs> Don't open your mouth or I'll get after you. <laughs> okay. Let's get to the business that we have at hand. <laughs> and I hope those three or four people who asked that I tell a little story enjoyed whatever I have tried to do. We are going to open nominations for officers board members, etc., to serve this council for the ensuing two years.
when nominations are opened and someone offers a nomination, would you please, for the benefit of the uh, secretary and the minutes, give your name, your international union, <coughs> and your local union number, and the location, the town you come from? I will announce for three times before closing nominations. The nominations are now open for president of the Mississippi AFL-CIO to serve for two years. Yes, sir. Come on. He's coming to the podium. I'd like to take this opportunity to put in nomination name of a man that I have worked with for the last four years continuously. I requested to have this honor putting this man's name in the election this morning and uh, was going to have a long speech but I think the only thing I can say about this man is that he is union 24 hours a day seven days a week anytime of the day or night you call him he gets you the help that you need the many times that I've called on him personally he's produced for me so at this time, I'd like to put in nomination name of Claude Ramsey. <clears throat> You've heard the nomination of Brother Claude Ramsey. <coughs> Brother Ramsey, do you accept? <coughs> Brother Ramsey does accept. Are there further nominations? Are there further nominations twice? Are there further nominations for the third and last time? Hearing none, nominations are closed. And the chair will declare that Brother Claude Ramsey is elected president of the Mississippi AFL-CIO for the coming two years by the unanimous vote of the convention. Nominations are now open for five vice presidents. Brother Beckham. Chairman, before I put the name for this your, your, your international union, please, sir. How about now? Now. T.G. Beckham, <coughs> IBEW Local 1435, Jackson, Mississippi. Mr. Chairman, before I put this name in before these delegates, I would like to tell you that it's not all bad when you retire. You'll never get it out of your system. You've had it in there too long, just like myself because I'm going on, soon will be five years retired, and I haven't given it up yet, and you won't either. I just thought I'd pass that information on to you. Wasn't figuring on it. <laughs> Beg your pardon? I wasn't figuring on giving it up. I figured that too. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, I rise to place the name of a man who I have known, I would say, as long as almost as long as he has been in the IBEW. I have been there just a little longer, not much, but a little bit. And I have found him to be an upstanding 
union member. He spent practically his whole membership life in, um, as an officer of his local union. He's been a member of the IBEW for 23 years. He's been an officer of his local union for 12 years. And business agent, this makes his third term as business agent. Two years as state president of the building trades and two years on the executive board of this organization. I know this man and been knowing him a long time. And I consider him one of my closest, dearest friends. I feel like that if I should get in trouble in Timbuktu, I should call on this man, he'd come to my aid. That's how much I think of him. And I hope he does me the same. It gives me great pleasure to place before this body the name of Brother R. L. Tucker, IBEW Local Union 917, Meridian, Mississippi. Brother Tucker, are you in the room? Do you accept the nomination, sir? Brother Tucker accepts. I'm George Johnson with the Jackson Central Labor Union, a member of CWA 10511. I would like to place the name of a man that I have worked with for a number of years in the Jackson Central Labor Union that has shown me that he can get the job done, that has shown me in a number of ways that he can do any kind of work that needs to be done in the labor movement. This man is one of the men that we have been privileged to have here in Jackson. He is president of the A. Philip Randolph Institute in the state of Mississippi. He's also a member of Far Central Labor Union, and he works real hard and willingly with us. I'd like to place the name of Robert Woodson. Brother Woodson is with the uh, uh, Carpenters. Carpenters Local 3031, I believe 30, it is. Brother Woodson? You accept, sir? Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I'm Darla Camp Poteet. I'm Vice President of ACWA Local 643 in Water Valley. I nominate a man who has served all of our locals in many capacities and is presently our Mississippi Joint Board Manager. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, I respectfully submit to you the name, James Jackson. Brother James Jackson has been nominated. Brother James, you accept? Brother Jackson accepts. Brother Clark. Mr. Chairman, I'm L.D. Clark, Local Union 1209, IBW, Murray, Mississippi. Uh, most of you yesterday heard me talk briefly on a two-year term instead of a four. This is one reason that I spoke on that because of the job that the people are doing in this Labor Council on the boards and vice presidents. Uh, we are fortunate to have people to get out and work and get the job done and to get endorsement terms whenever they deserve it. The man that I'm nominating here this morning, placing his name in nomination, is Brother Russell Kelly. He was the IAM Local 1133. He's been a vice president of this organi organization for the past two years, and I understand that he's made himself available and whenever called on to do whatever the job required. He's also the business representative for District 73 along the Gulf Coast in Mississippi for the machinists. He's a young, energetic young man and, and can get the job done for us, and I'd like to place his name back in nomination for another term as vice president. Thank you, Brother Clark. Brother Kelly, are you in the room? Yes, sir. You accept, sir? Yes. Brother Kelly accepts. Go ahead. 
Mr. Chairman, I'm Wayman Goodman, Columbus and Vicinity Central Labor Union, also IUE Local 794 in the Columbus area. I rise to place a name and nomination, the one that I have been privileged to work with for a number of years in the labor movement, the one that has done a tremendous job uh, overall in the Columbus and vicinity Central Labor Union area and throughout the state as he has served now for some four years on the executive board itself of the Mississippi AFL CIO. Uh, this individual is with the is not with the IUE. He's in he's with the Boilermakers who is uh, has been instrumental in many organizational campaigns in his area and uh, has worked uh, in a number of areas in that and his job that he's reportedly have done on the executive board has been one of tireless and uh, of long work. And the name that I place before you at this time is that of Curtis Orman with the Boilermakers 903 in West Point, Mississippi. Brother Orman? Do you accept, sir? Yes. Brother Orman accepts. Mr. Chairman, it's F.M. Oglesby, Local 303, United Rubber Workers, Natchez, Mississippi. I'd like to nominate a man from my local who served as, vi as the vice president for the past two years, Robert L. Bob Fly. Brother Fly, you accept, sir? Brother Fly accepts. <laughs> Are there further nominations? For the second time, are there further nominations? <coughs> For the third and last time, are there further nominations? No further nominations. Third and last time has been called. I don't know whether we're holding the conference over there to have more nominations or not. The chair will declare that nominations are closed. The six nominees are R.L. Tucker, Bob Woodson, James Jackson, Russell Kelly, Curtis Orman, and Bob Fly. Somebody asked me a while ago, be sure and not forget the Secretary of Treasury. <coughs> I don't know now whether nominations are necessary or not. But not, nominations are now open for Secretary of Treasury. Mr. Chairman. I am Dorothy Till, Local 563, Hattiesburg, Mississippi. I am honored today to place in nomination for Secretary Treasurer a member of my own local union. This person was our first president back in 1948. He has devoted more than 26 years of his life to the labor movement in this state. He has been an outstanding leader in our state's organizations. At this time, I place the nomination for the Secretary of Treasure of the Mississippi AFL-CIO, Thomas Knight. Thank you. Brother Knight, do you accept the nomination, sir? Yes. Brother Knight accepts. Are there further nominations once? Further nominations twice? For the third and the last time, any more nominations? Hearing none, the chair declares nominations are closed and declares that Brother Knight has been elected Secretary Treasurer of the Mississippi AFL-CIO for the coming two years by the unanimous, unanimous vote of this convention.
Nominations are now open for 10 executive board members. Brother Fitzhugh. Jones R. Fitzhugh, Cartman's Local 3031, Jackson, Mississippi. Mr. Chairman, it gives me great pleasure at this time placing nomination for a board member of the state AFL-CIO, a gentleman that's been an active member in the labor movement for a long period of time. He's a member of Carpenter's Local 387 in Columbus, Brother Marvin Taylor. <coughs> Brother Marvin Taylor. Is Brother Taylor in the room? You accept, sir? Brother Taylor accepts. Tommy? Brother Chairman, T.G. Beckham, business agent, local union, 1435 IBEW, Jackson, Mississippi. I'm kind of like a jumping jack. I'm up here again, but with a good reason. I'd like to place in the name of Joe Davis, present member of the board, before this delegation for their consideration. He served six years as president business agent of IBEW Local 1028 in Tupelo, Mississippi. Served one time, one term as president of the Tupelo Central Labor Union. And has served a full term and now just before completing another, starting on another term as secretary treasurer of the Mississippi State Federation of, La of the Mississippi Electrical Workers Association. I've known Joe Davis for ever since he's been a member of the IBEW also. He's a hard worker, he's conscientious, and I think the board would be doing themselves a service if they should retain him as a member of the board. Thank you. Thank you, Tommy. <laughs> Brother Davis, <coughs> you accept, sir? Accepts. Mr. Chairman, I'm Charlie Horn. President of International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, Local 2262 here in Jackson, Mississippi. I arrived to place a nomination, a young man who I feel has been very instrumental within the trade union movement within the Jackson area and throughout the state of Mississippi. He began to unite the allies between trade union, between the skilled trades and manufacturing within the, within the Jackson area. You've also been instrumental in creating training programs for young people and minorities within the Jackson area. At this time, I would like to place a nomination for Vice President, or Executive Board Member, I'm sorry, Executive Board Member, Mr. LeVon Tucker, Business agent of Local 480 of IBEW. Brother Tucker, <clears throat> you accept, sir? Brother Tucker accepts. Mr. Chairman, William R. Bell, Rubber Workers Local 845 in Tupelo. I rise to place a man's name and nomination that has served our local union since 1968. He has served as secretary of the local union. He served one term as president. For the past year, he has been assigned temporarily to the international staff in organizing in North Mississippi. Uh, most recently, he is working with the IUD program in Tupelo. He has served three terms on the state executive board, and at this time, I'd like to place the name of Mr. Howard Underwood for executive board member. Brother Underwood, you accept, sir? Brother Underwood accepts. Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> Jerry Rogers from uh, Local 10511 Communication Workers of America in Jackson. It's with a distinct pleasure that I'd like to place in nomination Mary I. Bryant, Communication Workers of America 10511 Jackson, Mississippi. Is that Brian, B-R-Y-A-N? Right, sir. Right. Okay. B-R-Y-A-N-T. Sister Brian? 
You accept? Yes. Miss Brown. Yes, ma'am. She accepts. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, Brother Wayman Goodman, IUE Local 794. Before I make this nomination, I'd like to inquire just what Brother Beckham and you was talking about you didn't intend to quit doing. <laughs> you want a public answer? Or <laughs> <laughs> that didn't seem to be too clear a moment ago. When that was my... I rise for the purpose of placing the name of nomination of a man with the IUE for the executive board. Uh, we hear a lot of speeches about long time service and this type thing of individuals. Uh, this individual hasn't, uh, doesn't have a long time service, but it seems that the accomplishments that he's made with the short period of time that he's been uh, in the labor movement uh, deserves a great applaud. And uh, of course, it seems that his abilities are unlimited. He has youth, he has energy, and he has uh, the insight to get the job done. And we feel very deserving for uh, a spot on the state executive board. Uh, and uh, he's a man that, in one of our newly organized local unions, just south of here in Crystal Springs, Mississippi, that uh, only a couple of years ago there was no local union in that town and now I understand practically everything in town is organized and it's been through his efforts, much of his efforts, his cooperation throughout the labor movement with various international unions and this type thing that this has been, a, that this has been accomplished. So with this in mind, I'd like to place in the name of Dennis Smith in nomination for executive board. Brother Smith? You accept, sir? Brother Smith accepts. Mr. Chairman, my name is Ruth White. I'm with the Malamated Clothing Workers, Local 707 in Corinth, and I rise to place the name of Doris Miller, nomination for executive board. She has served her Local 707 as financial secretary. She has served on this board for two years, and she is the recording secretary for the CLU in Corinth. Thank you, ma'am. Sister Miller? Ms. Miller, you accept? Okay, thank you, ma'am. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Chairman, I'm G.W. Tyson of the Iron Workers Local 469, business manager in Jackson. I rise to place the name and nomination of a dedicated trade unionist, Brother Lewis Turner, from the uh, cement and uh, Plasters Union in Jackson, Mississippi here. Thank you. Brother Turner, you accept? <coughs> Brother Turner accepts. Mr. Chairman, I'm L.J. Brown from Gulfport, Mississippi, business manager of Labor's Local 469, Labor's International Union of North America. I like to place a nomination for a man that I've been knowing for a number of years. He's a member of the Long Showman's Local 1303, Gulfport, Mississippi. He worked as an officer in that union for a number of years. He's a very good worker of, for the labor movement. And the name is Brother Herbert Williams. Brother Williams? You accept, sir? Brother Williams accepts. Mr. Chairman, my name is uh, Chester Gossett from Greenville, Mississippi, a member of uh, 14, 1543 United Steel Works of America. And I would like to place the name of uh, Mr. E.M. Grantham, who is a, a member, has been a member of the United Steel Works for 15 years, who is presently serving on the uh, executive board. And he was one of the first members one of the first steel workers in Mississippi to join, and he also is the president of the Greenville Central Labor Council. At this time, I would like his name to be placed on the uh, nomination for executive board member. Thank you. Brother Grantham, you accept, sir? Brother Grantham accepts. Mr. Chairman, I am Loretta Hanna, delegate from the Aluma Worker Union, Local 202, Grenada, Mississippi. 
I rise to place and nomination a man who is a member, shop steward, and vice president of the Lunar Worker Local 202. He is the president of the North Delta Central Labor Council and president of the North Central Mississippi Chapter A. Philip Randolph Institution. I know him as a man that has worked hard in the labor movement all over the state and in the community helping, uh, helping the working people. I know him as a man that believes in unity. He has said many times that in unity there is strength, and united we stand, the value we fall. Mr. Chairman, I place nomination Mr. Cecil Shelton from Grenada on the Mississippi AFC. What was Exec his name? Cecil Shelton. Cecil Shelton. Brother Shelton, you accept, sir? Brother, Sh Brother Shelton accepts. <clears throat> I'm Wade Chatham with the Meridian Central Labor Council. I would like to place the name and nomination of Mavis Rochelle with the CWA in Cleveland, Mississippi. Mavis who? Rochelle. Sister Michelle? You accept? Sister Michelle accepts. Are there further nominations? Are there further nominations twice for the executive board? Are there further nominations the third and last time? Hearing none, nominations are closed. I think we have 11 nominees. Let me see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Twelve, right. I started another sheet and I was about to throw it away. I think that, for the moment anyway, this concludes my little tour of duty here. And I want to repeat what I have said earlier. I may be retired, but I haven't quit. And Brother Goodman, you put your own interpretation on what I mean by that. <laughs> and when, he, when any of you roving ambassadors are in town or going through town or get close to town, pick up your telephone and give me a call. I'd be glad to hear from you because I want to keep in touch. I've been in this business too long to want to drop out of it completely now, and I don't. And again, Brother Claude, Brother Tom, new delegates, officers, I just don't know how to say much of anything except thank you. I appreciate it. And this plaque will have a very honored and a very prominent position on the wall in my den. Good luck, keep up the good work, and may God bless all of you. Thank you. Uh, on behalf of this convention, we want to express our appreciation to you for participating in our program here today and wish you the best of luck from you, on, you and your wife. Thank you. Appreciate it. All that hard work. Before we <coughs> uh, bring on our next speaker, I now want to appoint the elections committee. Before I do that, I want to express my appreciation to this convention for the confidence that you've placed in me once again. With your help, I'm confident that we can truly make our state a better place in which to live. And I will be looking forward to working with each and every one of you during the next two years. I'm sure we'll be calling on you before the year is up. I will have a few more words to say before the convention adjourns, but I did want you to 
I don't know how I felt here at this particular time. This time, I'd like to name the people to handle the election. I don't believe any of these people were nominated <coughs> for an office <coughs> on the executive board. And according to the Constitution, <coughs> we have to have a seven-member committee. No two can come from the same union, <coughs> and no two can come <coughs> from the same city, union or city. Now, I don't believe any of these people are con to come from the same union or the same city. Brother W.H. Wood has agreed to serve again as chairman of this important committee. Brother John Abrams, is he present? Brother Abrams would like for you to serve. Dolla Poteet, she's present. <coughs> Sarah Chestnut, from Kosciuszko CWA, is she present? Sarah, I know you were here earlier. Where is Sarah? Somebody advised Sarah that uh, I've asked her to serve on this important committee. Brother Gold Smith from URW and Natchez. Brother Smith present. Brother Gold Smith from the Natchez Rubber Workers Local. Is he present? Would you please advise him that uh, he's been appointed to serve on the Elections Committee? Uh, Margaret Towery from IM Local 1133 in Pascagoula. Margaret, are you here? You've got a job. And Loretha Hunter, aluminum workers in Grenada. Is Loretha Hunter present? We'd like for you to serve on that committee also. Our secretaries uh, will be <coughs> preparing the ballot. Uh, we will start the election, as you know, at 3 o'clock this afternoon. We'll take over and have the election process. Before I bring on our next speaker, I've got an announcement to make. I think all of you will be interested in this. Uh, we polled the delegation, as you know, and we hope all of you voted, in an attempt to find out <coughs> who your choice in the next president of this country might be, and I'd like to announce those results. <coughs> Governor Wendell Anderson won. Governor Reuben Askew won. Senator Birch by three. Governor Dale Bumpers, two. John Gilligan, one. Scoop Jackson, 30. Senator Walter Mondale, 165. Senator, <laughs> Senator Edmund Muskie, six. Senator Adlai Stevenson, one. <laughs> Governor George Wallace, 30. A right in, two votes for Hubert Humphrey. Voted 21. We had 21 people try to tried to vote for two nominees, and no one voted for a Republican. I thought you'd be interested. <laughs> so it would definitely appear that Senator Mondale, that his visit to Mississippi, might have had a little influence with the delegates to this convention. Will our escort committee please bring on our next speaker? Thank you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we are very fortunate here this morning to have with us a very distinguished individual. And I think that perhaps you might be interested in knowing that he's a native Mississippian. Fred O'Neill was born and spent his early days in our state. I understand just north of Macon, Fred? That's right. In Knoxville County. Uh, we're delighted to have him return home, return home to his native state today. Fred, I think you'll find things quite different today than when you left at a 
early day in your life. Fred O'Neill is president of the Actors, Associated Actors Union, an AFL-CO affiliate. He is also a vice president of the AFL-CIO. Now, Fred sent me a lot of material about his background, many of the projects that he's been involved in, and he asked me a few minutes ago if I was going to read all that material that he sent me. I told him, no, Fred, I'm not about to do that. I'll take too much of your valuable time here. We're interested in hearing from you yourself and not me reading your record and, your hist and the history of what you have actually been doing. But I would like to say to you that Fred O'Neill has done a magnificent job as a president of his international union and as a member of the executive council of the FFL-CO and this whole area of human rights and attempting to do something for the people of this country regardless of their race. And at this time, it gives me a great deal of pleasure to present to you Brother Fred O'Neill, president of the Actors' Union. Brother O'Neill. Thank you, President Ramsey. <clears throat> Officers, members, and guests of the Mississippi State Federation AFL-CIO. As you mentioned, <clears throat> I was born in this state, and of course, my great pleasure at being here is increased by the fact that I was born in Brooksville, Mississippi. My father attended Alcorn College. It was college then, it's a university now. And soon after his death, my family moved to St. Louis. And so I have no more relatives in the state now and this marks my first time back into the state in 54 years. I left in 1920, and I have not been back since. I want to say, though, that I've not remained away uh, from, from choice, but because I, I haven't had the opportunity or the occasion to come back. And so you can understand my pleasant reaction when I received an invitation from President Ramsey to come down today and address this body. As I came off the plane and we were going out the door, I noticed something that was, that was uh, very visibly absent, and that was the signs colored and white that was so evident in the days that I spent in this state. So it is a tremendous change since that time. And my feeling is that you have been greatly responsible for that change. You know, whenever we are privileged to appear before a group such as this, we feel a great pride, a sense of movement, on being present and being a part of that movement. And uh, as leaders in the trade union movement, we are all conscious of the fact that we will be judged by the quality of leadership given in the elevation of standards and aspirations of those we represent and the examples we are setting for the youth of the nation. The work we are doing towards building the image of the overall labor movement. I'm sure that you will all agree that there is a great necessity, a duty, yes, and an obligation on the part of each and every one of us to encourage others by our 
good example, to follow in our footsteps, and to charge them to equal, and even more important, to surpass our modest accomplishments. Encourage others to attend union meetings, to participate, to vote, to speak out on the issues. And through this uh, crucible of activity will emerge leadership material. Now this is especially important that we encourage and counsel young members and potential members. When you give some thought to the fact that within a period of 10 years or less, a little more so in some cases, that a great number of these young people will be taking on the obligations and the responsibilities that we share today. And they must be properly guided while we are still alive and active if the labor movement is to continue to grow in the manner that we all envision and hope for. You know, speakers often open their remarks with uh, the statement, well, we are meeting at a critical time. Well, I can't remember when we have met at a time it was not a crucial period. And so it is today. There, it is a time of urgency. I remember a story that I.W. Abel told, and I'm quite sure he's told it quite often. Those of you who are members of the Steel Workers Union, I'm sure that you probably heard Abe tell this story about the bee and the bull. It was this little bee that kept stinging the bull in places where they couldn't, uh, he couldn't uh, brush him off. And so the bull said, well, you know, one day I'm going to get this little bee. And so one day he found him asleep on a pile. You know what? <laughs> and so he swallowed the bee. And the bee felt so comfortable inside the bull in the soft intestines and so forth. So the bee said, well, this is wonderful. I think I'll just take a little nap. And when I wake up, I'll sting the bejesus out of it. But alas, when the bee woke up, the bull had gone. <laughs> so as I say, ladies and gentlemen, time is of the essence. <laughs> Now, of course, uh, <clears throat> I think that one thing that we have to keep in mind, and that is that, that we have made progress. And the second thing is that, that, that progress and future progress that is necessary to bring about an equal and progressive society is under considerable threat from what's going on in Washington today. Now, I'm not simply talking about the various budget cutbacks that has been proposed, although these are serious enough. <clears throat> I'm rather talking about what appears to be a long-range strategy of the administration to institutionalize and reinforce the false notion that liberal programs cannot so uh, solve society's needs. Now, confronted with this rather serious threat, our most important task in the days ahead is to develop a response and a strategy to deal with, the with what the administration is doing. We must formulate a basic program of our own as an alternative to the cutbacks, to the retrenchments, and the do-nothingness of this administration. One of the first things that we must do, <clears throat> as I've said, is to acknowledge that we have made progress. Now, too often today, <clears throat> we hear people say that things are as bad now or even worse than they ever were. Well, this is simply not true. And it is strategically disastrous. This is not to say that all programs have been successful, but if we say that the money spent for education programs, housing programs, manpower training, and all the rest of the liberal social programs is money that has been wasted, 
then we are only inviting the sort of cutbacks that we face today. For eventually people will question whether it's worthwhile spending money for programs that don't work. Now, if those of us who are committed to this kind of progressive change in our American society contend that these types of programs have not worked as we know they have worked, then the president can feel perfectly justified in his policies of, of uh, uh, scarcity, calling such programs inflationary, while the Congress increases its members' expense accounts by $6,000 annually. And they did this very quietly, even without a voice vote. You didn't know about that, I'm sure. I didn't know about it until a few days ago. $6,000 annually, an expense account. And these are the same people who voted against a $2 minimum wage. I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, there's something, something rather sordid about that sort of action. And this brings to mind the importance and the necessity of the election of local, state, and national political candidates who are sensitive to the needs of working class citizens, the poor and the needy. And in this respect, we must form the kind of political alliances between groups in similar circumstances, the blacks, the Puerto Ricans, the poor, the disadvantaged, white as well as black, in the kind of coalitions, biracial, liberal, religious movements, which can draw the broad support of all Americans who need social change. <coughs> and by the way, in assembling these types of coalitions, we do so with a full understanding that they will not always agree on every issue, but are more often than not brought together by a strong sense of common interest. And in doing this, we don't have to love each other, although it would be well if we did. But we must face up to reality, move away from meaningless sloganizing and rhetorical spewing of hot air. And just a word to my black brothers and sisters, and that is this, we've got to move away from the preoccupation with black is beautiful, of course it is. My God, my father named me after Frederick Douglass 65 years ago, so he knew it then. You gotta do other things now, we know that. We've got to move towards action to make blacks as well as other disadvantaged groups economically powerful. Black may be beautiful, but black beauty alone isn't worth a damn without some green to go along with it. Yes. That's gonna con convince everybody, including ourselves, that we do indeed speak the truth. Now, I know there are those who would like to simplify problems in order to avoid facing difficult realities. They've told us that blacks can be powerful only if they go it alone. Well, I think we're learning better now. Senator Brooke made a speech on this about a year ago. Of course, the exact opposite is true. We will be economically powerful and sufficient when we intelligently use our efforts in a coalition with other groups to bring about major reforms in our society. We have seen the extremist and the separatist movements. We've seen them rise and we've seen them fall. And we've also seen the emergence of a new and a powerful political movement in the black community. <clears throat> now this new movement has been slower in development than the black power movement because it did not base itself in explosive emotional rhetoric and activities, but it took root in slowly evolving political and economic conditions. It has been able to grow so that today it is beginning to bear fruit in the form of sophisticated political awareness and genuine power. And therefore, we must conclude that you cannot build a successful political agenda on the basis of race consciousness alone. There are too many programs and strategies proposed today which seek to somehow transform society through a concept of blackness. Too often black slogans and lifestyles are utilized as ends in themselves. You go out and you buy a dashiki and you, and you shape your hair in, in, in certain ways and that's the end of it. There's nothing wrong with that, of course. But let that not be the end of it, for God's sake. Let that not be an end in itself. 
and feel that now I am free. I am this, that, and the other. You are not free until you are economically secure. And we are not that economically secure today. <laughs> what black people basically need are the same things all poor people need. Thus, instead of quota systems, which might place a few blacks in a few jobs, we're much better off pursuing massive programs that create jobs. As Bayard Rustin said some time ago, he said, you take here in Harlem. <coughs> if all the blacks were to turn white overnight, we would still have a housing shortage. We would have unemployment. We would have ghetto conditions. We would have crime. We would have health needs, et cetera, et cetera. In other words, these basic shortages would still exist. So concentration should be, should be, should be focused on creating more jobs and more housing, better health, better health uh, service, and so forth. And in pursuing these goals, <clears throat> it's well to remember that there's no greater ally than the labor movement. Despite the cry of the union haters and the labor baiters to the contrary. Now, this is not to deny that pockets of discrimination still exist in some unions, but not in the movement as a whole. And to those who may doubt this fact, I refer to the record where you'll find that every piece of social legislation since 1954 was only made possible through the working coalition of the civil rights and the labor movement. Now, if you care to question this fact, you have only to ask Clarence Mitchell, the legislative representative of the NAACP, Sterling Tucker of the National Urban League, and Andy B. Miller, the legislative director of the FFLCIO. Most of the objectives of the blacks, the Spanish-speaking people, and other minorities, both black and white, are the same as those of the labor movement. <coughs> when you increase the minimum wage, you're raising the living standards of all exploitive workers, mostly non-organized groups. When and if we are able to get the passage of the National Health Insurance Act, we will relieve the frightened mothers, the fathers, the sons, the daughters, who feel that because they are unable to meet the mounting cost of medical services, their dear ones may be crippled, blinded, and even meet their death because of our inability to cope with their medical needs. When we are able to provide decent housing at a reasonable cost, blacks, whites, and all other colors, will shout glory hallelujah. And if somehow we could outlaw the right to work laws, uh, I think they left a word off of that. It's right to work cheaper. Cheaper, and that's the word they left out. <laughs> if we could do that, we could enable thousands of poorly paid, discriminated against workers to gain the dignity that comes from union representation. If we could stop the exportation of jobs to Europe, to Japan, to Taiwan, to Hong Kong, and other foreign countries, we would be salvaging many jobs that have and could be filled by blacks as well as other minorities. I want to give you an illustration of this. Just a couple of years ago, there was a shoe factory in Waltham, Massachusetts that had to close down because they couldn't compete with the cheaply made shoes in the foreign countries. That put 6,000 people out of work. You cannot buy a tape recorder made in this country. That's a sad but true fact. That's where the work is going, ladies and gentlemen. And I think that we too should look, a, look, look at the label in our clothes. We should look at the label on the goods that we buy and see if they are union made. Not only just lettuce, not only just gallo wine, but look at the label and see if they were made by a brother unionist. Too often, we buy indiscriminately. I remember at a meeting in Washington that we had on the exportation of jobs. One <clears throat> man got up and he held up a shirt that was made in Hong Kong. And he talked about how the jobs were being exported to Hong Kong. And then he walked outside 
and he got into his Toyota and drove home. <laughs> you see what I'm talking about? We only know it when it affects us. We never think about it when it affects our brother unionists. That's the point. There are, and I was surprised to hear this, six million illegal aliens in this country who are working. Now, I'm not talking about the ones who entered legally. I'm talking about illegal aliens. You know, at our conference with uh, President Ford, a few weeks ago, we emphasized these problems. <coughs> and <coughs> of course, it reminds me, at that particular conference, one of the presidents of the, the building trades union said to President Ford, he said, you know, I got my best lesson in economy a few years ago when one of the laborers were, <coughs> was, was um, uh, told to dig a hole for a very, uh, for a post that was to go into that hole. And the boss came by and he says, well, he says, uh, how long does it take him to dig that hole? He says, well, it takes him four hours. Well, he says, why can't we put two men on it and do it in two hours? So the foreman said to him, he says, well, why don't we put four men on it and forget about the damn hole? <laughs> Well, <laughs> the, 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 the president enjoyed that, but I don't think he got the point. <clears throat> <laughs> you know, <clears throat> there's still people that are with us that say that uh, these issues are obsolete, that we've attained a level of consciousness, they tell us, where the issues of the workplace don't matter anymore. Well. Of course, this is just pure nonsense. If someone were to ask me where I thought the civil rights movement was right now, I would answer right here in the struggle of the working people and their dependents to achieve a better life. That's where it is. In 1963, A. Philip Randolph called the March on Washington a march for jobs and freedom. Well, we've secured many of those freedoms. <clears throat> Now it is the economic agenda of the civil rights movement that is still unfulfilled. And when you fill that need, you can lay odds that those, those unfulfilled civil rights will fall in line. You remember that old line in the Bible where it says, uh, Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. And that is true. When you fulfill that, those economic needs, the rest of these will fall in place. In the coming period, our job will be to fashion a political movement which sees these basic issues as fundamental to social change. The two most important forces within that movement are blacks and organized labor. Today, the civil rights movement and the labor movement continue to speak for those who critically need economic transformation. The labor movement is more than the most effective means of achieving economic equality. It is society's most integrated institution. And according to the Urban League study made a few years ago, blacks hold more policy-making positions within the labor movement today than in any other segment of our society. The schools, the government, the media, yes, even the church. There are more people in policy-making levels in the labor movement. And finally, Labor is important because it has a program. It has a program for jobs, for education, for tax justice, for housing, for health, for countless other things. When combined, make up an agenda for truly dramatic transformation of society. The cooperation of the labor movement and the blacks and other minorities has often been referred to as the browning of America. Well, if we can add a little green, we are home safe. Thank you. much, Brother O'Neill, for such a splendid address. <coughs>
very timely. I can assure you that we in Mississippi are attempting to accomplish many of the things that you uh, talk about. We recognize the fact that if black's going to be beautiful, it has to have green to go along with it, and we're trying to do something about that. We're also attempting to put together the type coalition that you referred to to elect the right kinds of people to office. And we have a very important election in this congressional district. Uh, I'm sure you're aware of that. Uh, I'm sure you're aware that Fannie Neal and Norman Hill have been in our state recently and that we're attempting to get our labor folks and our black friends and what have you together and elect a true friend of the working people in the 4th Congressional District in Mississippi. I'm delighted that you're present here this morning. We'd like to invite you to spend the rest of the day with us if you can. You can't well understand that uh, your schedule will not permit. Good luck to you, Fred. Thank you very much. Let me see, uh, let me make an inquiry if our next uh, speaker's arrived. Would you all like to uh, escort the... He's here? And the next speaker, I've got a couple of <clears throat> announcements I think I perhaps ought to make. Just hold him there for a minute. Uh, Mr. Robert Hodges, is he present? You left your medicine in the restaurant. You can find it at the desk. Mr. Magalini, the president of the Gulfport Teachers Union, is present, has to leave. <clears throat> Wanted me to recognize him before he left. Where are you at, brother Magalini? President of the Teachers Union on the Gulf Coast. Uh, they are getting themselves organized and hopefully will be elected, I mean, affiliated in the near future. I'm sorry, I thought you said Magdalena. And your name? Rodberg. Happy to have you with us. Look forward to having you affiliate with this organization and working with us. All right, will the escort committee please bring in our next speaker? <coughs> Gentlemen, <clears throat> many of you will recall, I'm sure, a couple of years ago, we had a congressional contest or two in our state. We had three incumbent congressmen step down, and we had to elect three new congressmen. At that time, we had a difficult situation to deal with. The president of the United States at that time, Richard Nixon, had some long coattails. And the result of those long coattails, a couple of Republicans were elected to the Congress of the United States. We had three good Democrats nominated, one in the second district, one in the fourth, one in the fifth. We were successful in helping elect only one of those three congressmen. We're privileged today to have with us the congressman from the second district was successful in being elected. We're happy that he's here this morning. Mr. Bowen, it gives me a great deal of pleasure to present you now, this time, to this convention. Congressman Bowen. Thank you, Claude. I certainly do appreciate it, and it's uh, great to be with you today. I certainly want to assure you that I am very proud and honored to be, I believe if my figures are correct, and Claude tells me that I am, to be the first member of Congress from the state of Mississippi ever to win with the endorsement of organized labor. And uh, I'm very proud to tell anybody in my district and in the state of Mississippi that uh, I'm pleased to have the support of the working people of my district, and I feel that uh, the 20,000 or so union families of the second district are hardworking taxpayers of our district and our state who make a vital daily contribution to the progress and life of their communities and state. And uh, I think that uh, politician of all politicians and <coughs> men on the street and just folks in general throughout Mississippi are realizing that, uh, that uh, organized labor is a, is a very vital, potent force 
in the social and economic and political life of our state, and more and more people are perking up and taking notice, because there were a whole lot of people who told me in 72 that it really wasn't possible to win with the support of organized labor. They said that'd be the kiss of death. You've got to, got to avoid that. Well, I was very pleased to have your support, and I want to thank you for it. From the bottom of my heart, you really put out a terrific effort in 72. I appreciate it, and I certainly am grateful for your support right now in 1974. I would like to talk a little bit about what's been going on in Washington. I wish that I had some good news for you. There, unfortunately, is not a whole lot that's very amusing or humorous about the state of our economy these days. Uh, anytime you get inflation and interest rates up to the 12% level, and the time you get unemployment to the 5 or 6% level, and people hurting as bad as they are throughout this country, then you've got troubles. And I'll just be frank to tell you that I haven't found very many people who have really clear-cut answers to them. Uh, although I noticed recently that uh, President Ford has been uh, campaigning around the country saying that all of our troubles are the fault of the Democrats, uh, that uh, that's really what's uh, got us in the bind that we're in. Uh, you know, I, I don't really try to be a very partisan sort of a member of Congress. I frankly try to work with Republicans up there. I try to work with uh, whoever's in the White House, whether it be Republican or Democrat. I uh, feel that it's in the best interest of you and the people of my district and my state and the country to try to work as effective as I can with people of all political persuasions. But uh, when the president does start circulating around the country, pointing the finger at Democrats and saying that uh, we uh, are really responsible for the troubles of the country, I think it's a little bit like uh, throwing rocks in a glass house. I think uh, he better be mighty careful about that. If you, in fact, if you want to look back at the record of what's been happening in this century, I think you'll find that uh, most of the economic crises during this century have occurred with the GOP at the helm of the executive branch and in full control of the vast powers over money, credit, and foreign trade, which the executive department can employ if it, uh, if it wants, if it has the will and the ideas to make its game plan work. Unfortunately, I think over the, the years, the Republican game plans have too often bogged down in recession or depression, and the Democrats have had to come in off the political bench and provide the leadership necessary to move our nation ahead to sound economic goals in order to provide jobs and adequate standard of living for a majority of Americans. Of course, uh, I'm sure some folks feel that's just accidental, but some of those accidents have, uh, uh, have happened so frequently that I'm afraid it's hard to see it in that light. Well, apart from the Great Depression itself, there were three major recessions during the Eisenhower years, and the current recession is the second such major economic slump since the Republicans took over five years ago. So when when they took control of the White House in 1969, they inherited at that time, in my opinion, a healthy, robust economy that enjoyed one of the longest sustained periods of economic growth and stability in the country's history. Uh, real growth between uh, 1961 and 1969 averaged 4.8% annually, resulting largely from average annual production increase of 6% and the creation of some 10 million new jobs. Unemployment was reduced in the 60s under Democratic leadership from 6.7% to only 3.5% when the mantle was handed over to the GOP. The same period saw the longest period of price stability since World War II. The Consumer Price Index went up at an annual rate of only 2.6%, and wholesale prices rose at an even slower pace. So in short, business was healthy, production was high, profits were reasonably high, working man's paycheck was worth something at the store. Of course, what's happened now in the last five years? Well, I think we all really know what's happening. It's happening to all of us. Unemployment's jumped to 5.8%. September figures recently have uh, revealed that 440,000 more Americans are jobless now than a month earlier. The total of unemployed is now up to 5.3 million. A percentage increase of nearly two-thirds over the 1969 figures. American industrial activity is down from 90% of capacity five years ago to only 80% now. Real economic growth has declined for three consecutive quarters and now slumping at a compounded annual rate of 4%. Uh, 
And of course, we all know what's happening to inflation. It's up in the 12% area, exceeded or equaled only by the high interest rates, which of course the highest since the Civil War, more than 100 years. Consumer prices have gone up 38% since 1969, with wholesale prices going up at a 52% rate. And since August of last year, the buying power of the average working man's paycheck has gone down more than 4%. Uh, of course, I don't have to enumerate for you the prices at the grocery store, but they have gone up generally more than other areas of the economy. An overall increase of about 51% in the last five years. Uh, the specific items that most people have to buy in uh, the marketplace. Uh, the purchasing power of the dollar for the average working man in this country, in, in fact, in terms of his real income, is back to about what it was 10 years ago. Now, that's pretty sad to, to look at the state of our economy when, when the working man in this country is being pushed backward uh, because of faulty economic policies on the part of his government. At the end of 1973 and uh, continuing on through 74, food prices have gone up some 20% overall, five times the annual rate for the 65 to 70 period. Of course, housing has gone up 40%, medical care has gone up 36%, uh, transportation gone up 35%. Of course, as you all know, gasoline, motor oil has gone up about 61%, and I don't need to tell you what's been happening to electrical rates here in the state of Mississippi. And uh, I think something could have been done about it. I think what the government chose to do about it was not, uh, was not the right thing. I think the tight money policy that the Republicans uh, have championed for so long just turned out to be the wrong thing. Uh, they have tightened the credit supply until, of course, the housing industry, the name just one, has almost been choked to death. Uh, they thought that the old-time traditional economics was still true, that if you jacked up the interest rate enough, you could dampen down inflation. Of course, that's not what happened at all. The high interest rates have simply fed the fires of inflation, made it much worse, and slowed the economy down at the same time. So uh, it's, uh, it's simply a, a fact of life that for some reason, uh, the leadership in the White House has not been prepared to accept. I don't understand why they can't see that the, that the policies are not working. I just fervently hope that they will uh, see that soon enough to prevent us from getting into the middle of a terrifically great depression. I, I think that all of us working together can prevent that, but uh, I think it's going to take uh, a change in direction on the part of the leadership of the executive branch if we're going to avoid it. Uh, of course, the kinds of solutions that have been proposed to, to check uh, the inflation and to try to bring about more employment seem to me uh, pitifully inadequate. Uh, the last thing, in my opinion, we need to do is raise taxes on middle-income working American families. Uh, certainly, I pledge to you my devout opposition to any kind of a surcharge, surtax, on top of what the heavy burden is that the worker and the small businessman and the farmer of this country is already paying. I mean, this uh, administration idea of a, of a surcharge hits those who are already bearing the largest burden of taxes. And uh, it's, uh, in effect, what, it's what you're doing is that you're, if that passed, you'd be taxing the working American in order to have the money to be able to give an investment credit to American industry, which is what's been proposed. Uh, I just don't think that uh, the U.S. Congress is going to buy that proposal. I think that's going to die on the vine very rapidly. And uh, there are, of course, some other things in, in uh, President Ford's proposals. There's the 31 points that he laid out before us in the Congress recently that are worthwhile. I mean, we all want to save fuel. We all want to save food. We want to economize. I mean, uh, whip inflation now is a nice motto. And I, I, I think there's some good Boy Scout virtues in some of the things that he has uh, pointed out to us. I mean, we will all try harder. You know, as he said, his, if you want to sum up the administration's uh, philosophy for America and the battle cry and the watchword for the nation, the real solution to our economic problems, you know, what is it? It's uh, take all you want, but eat all you take. Well, I mean, that's good, and I'm sure we'll try our best to do that, to keep our plates clean. But somehow or another, I don't really believe 
uh, that the administration has come to grips with the problem and uh, the simple uh, uh, array of solutions that they've laid out I don't think will get the job done. Uh, of course, there are a lot of things we can all do in the Congress. We're prepared to do our part. Uh, of course, to listen to the administration talk, you think that, uh, uh, that uh, all the budget cutters are on that side and all the big spenders are in Congress. Well, that's not really the case. As a matter of fact, in the uh, last five years, Congress has voted to cut more than 30 billions of dollars. That's democratically controlled Congress has voted to cut more than 30 billions of dollars off of budgets presented to the Congress by the White House. That is, we've trimmed back on budgets that the White House has presented to us. And uh, I personally, looking over my own voting record, found that in the last two years, I voted to cut more than 25 billions of dollars in unnecessary federal spending, which I think will help relieve some of the pressures for inflation, help move toward a balanced budget. Uh, I've uh, voted to cut uh, almost six billion in fat from the defense budget, our own congressman and my neighbor, Jamie Whitten, pointed out in testimony on the uh, floor of the House that uh, the Pentagon came to Congress this year with uh, almost seven billions of dollars in unobligated funds. They wanted it appropriated right back again, but there were seven billions of dollars that had been been uh, spent, uh, been, been appropriated to them last year. They couldn't spend, they couldn't obligate. And uh, I voted to cut a sizable chunk of that. And I certainly am a strong defender of, uh, of the, uh, the security and the strength of this nation. I want to see a, uh, an effective and capable and strong military establishment. But uh, I don't think that means that we just have to accept automatically everything the Pentagon asked for. And I think I can assure you that the Congress is going to take a, a very harsh and long look at some of the, uh, the fat which is in the defense budget. I also voted to cut about nine billions of dollars off the uh, mass transit bill, which, in my opinion, in terms of our interest right here in the state of Mississippi, uh, was designed to take money away from the taxpayers of uh, this state and those who actually use the automobiles of this country and put it into uh, mass transit in other parts of the country. They have problems, and I'd like to see them solved, but I just don't believe that the users of the automobiles and the, those who pay the taxes should put the bill for those services. And there are other areas where I voted to cut. I've voted against every foreign aid bill <coughs> appropriation since I've been in the Congress, and uh, I, I expect to continue that unless I see something unusually attractive that uh, I don't see right now in the program. Uh, but uh, the uh, Congress has uh, accepted President Ford's uh, recommendation that we try to set a $300 billion ceiling on the budget this year. Just before I left up there, we voted a resolution to take that $300 billion ceiling that he's recommended and, uh, um, and and do everything in our power to keep the spending under that level. I think that's, uh, that's certainly uh, a worthwhile goal. But at the same time we're talking about cutting spending, in my opinion, the mistake that the leaders in the White House make is that they seem to presume that the be-all and end-all of our problems is in the area of cutting federal spending. They seem to think that there wouldn't be any inflation if there weren't a, a, a deficit in the federal budget. That's simply not the case. Uh, I spent about uh, two days up there a few weeks ago attending this summit conference on inflation and heard an awful lot of economists debate these things. And I talked to a number of them, and I found a general consensus among, among those that I talked with that for every five billions of dollars that you cut off of federal spending, you may reduce inflation for some, of something up to a half a percentage point, at about a maximum of a half a percentage point. So let's say we look like we might run a $10 billion deficit this year. Hopefully it won't be that great. But let's say if it would be that, if we cut that off in some manner, uh, we might then conceivably reduce inflation by about one percentage point. That would take it down, let's say, from 12% to 11%. Uh, now that's good, mind you. I'm in favor of reducing it everywhere we can. But uh, I wouldn't want anybody to get carried away with the notion that just balancing the budget is going to end inflation. There simply is no real correlation uh, over the years, no correlation in economic data between the degree of budget deficit and the degree of inflation. They just don't usually go together. And uh, in fact, if, if you want to make a real point to somebody on this, you might remind them 
that if you took the whole public budget of the country, that is, not just the federal budget, but if you took the state and local budgets also, roll them all up together, there is a budget surplus. That is a government budget surplus in the country today because of the fact that state and local governments are running surpluses. Hence, the whole governmental budget of America, not just the one institution of the federal government, but the whole the whole federal, the whole federal, state, and local government structure is running a surplus. So we have not a deficit, but a surplus in the public budget of the country. But still, we've got inflation. So I just want to make the point that I'm trying my best. But I think we need to cut the muscle and bone out of vital programs to help America. I mean, there are just too many vital services, education, health, public works, manpower training, so many vital programs that we need to keep our economy vibrant and strong that uh, we can't afford to cut uh, just for the sake of trimming a few dollars off the budget. Because if the price of trimming that little bit off and a microscopic reduction in inflation is to get us into a tailspin, which might lead to a, to a, a, a real first-class depression, then I think nobody wants to get into that kind of a bang. Uh, the, there are a lot of other things we might be able to do. Uh, we, of course, uh, I think we, we might well consider revising provisions that encourage far, foreign oil production by generous tax credits and, uh, and, by, and discourage solely needed domestic oil and gas production. I mean, our policies have really played down over the years an effort to get production up here and have given extra bonuses to those who, who wanted to produce abroad. And at the same time, I don't think it would hurt us to revise minimum tax provisions to ensure that the, the super wealthy in the country pay a decent share of income tax. I think, frankly, something, can, something is really wrong when a couple <coughs> making $15,000 have got to pay more income tax than somebody making 600000 or even millions. And there are a lot of them in that category who pay no taxes. Uh, I just think that all Americans should, should bear a fair share of the, the burden of, of administering the affairs of this, this nation. But uh, to, be, to say that we've got to cut back on retirement programs, on Social Security, we've got to cut back on the things that are designed to give the young Americans, the older Americans, and all Americans a fair chance in life, I think uh, that is very poorly advised and uh, is a policy that I do not think will be accepted by the U.S. Congress, whatever uh, the opinion of it might be on the other end of Pennsylvania Avenue. Uh, you know, here in our state, we've got uh, a varied economy. We, I'm very proud of the growing industrial economy that we have here. For about three decades, we've been working very diligently in this state to uh, balance agriculture and industry. Uh, we've been moving away from a purely agricultural economy or largely agricultural toward one where highly skilled industrial jobs will be able to provide livable wages maintain at the same time a strong and prosperous agricultural economy. Uh, I uh, feel that it's necessary that we continue that prosperity on both fronts here in the state of Mississippi. I'm, I'm very proud to be involved in some of the legislation in Congress that deals with agriculture. Uh, we were able to pass legislation last year that I sponsored that uh, has saved the American taxpayer about three billion dollars a year in farm programs. And, We've designed a program that does not involve any of your tax money going out to pay farm to pay crop subsidies. Not a bit. We've designed a system of target prices which provide a minimum level, uh, one we hope which will not be approached by the market price of, of farm commodities, but one which does not involve payments regularly to support any kind of production. And I think this at the same time is going to be good for, for agriculture in our state. Uh, so uh, I think uh, we, we need to stop and consider the fact that, uh, that the, uh, the American farmer, you're and my neighbor here in this state, has a vital role in our economy. Uh, of course, his, his effectiveness, his productivity, which is the largest and the, the greatest in the world, is, is due in no small degree with what you have done for him. That is to say, you as working people, your technology and the equipment that you have designed and that you produce uh, have helped make him productive. Uh, now, that American farmer, by the same token, is contributing to your well-being. He spends nearly $50 billion a year for goods and services to produce crops and livestock. Another $20 billion or more for the same things that you 
as workers buy food, clothing, drugs, furniture, appliances, and other products and services. Three out of every 10 jobs in private industry are related to agriculture. Eight million in storing, processing, and merchandising agricultural products, and six million in providing supplies that the farmers use. The farmers of this country buy more than $5 billion annually in tractors and other vehicles and equipment, and they spend well over $5 billion annually for fuel and lubricants to maintain and operate this equipment. Farmers of the country spend about $3 billion annually for fertilizer and lime, and those of you who are in the metal trades industries may be interested to know that farm machinery, trucks, cars, fencing, and building materials use one-third as much steel as our giant automotive industry utilizes, and that's a big, a very big chunk of money and, and a lot of jobs being created by that buying power. Uh, and at the same time, quite frankly, I don't think the American farmer is being overly compensated for his efforts. Uh, he gets about 40 cents of every dollar spent for food. Well, of course, out of a loaf of bread, he gets about four cents out of the price of that loaf of bread. And uh, I think that uh, part of the real problem that we're facing today is uh, not what the producer of the agricultural commodity is getting, but what that middleman is getting. And uh, the question that we are asking up there in the Congress right now and that we're demanding that the Federal Trade Commission and other federal agencies investigate and produce answers to is the question of why is there so great a disparity, so great a differential between what the producer of food and fibers gets and what you pay in the store? Uh, why is it that uh, at a time when the producer of beef is uh, making less money than he ever has, the price of what you have to pay in the meat market has dropped only very slightly. I think this calls for major investigation on the part of the, the executive branch of the government as well as, as the Congress. The executive has the agencies, the personnel, the staff, the facilities, and the legal mandate to do it, and I hope that they will. And I think it's going to call for some zealous enforcement of uh, antitrust legislation, anything else which is going to jack those prices up and keep them up. We've got to make the forces of competition work if we're going to tackle effectively the kind of inflation that's got this country in its grip. In the area of, uh, of uh, foreign trade, uh, I am very deeply committed to trying to protect American industry from unfair and discriminatory uh, foreign competition. I think one of the problems that we have to deal with is a situation where you have export subsidies on the part of foreign countries where foreign producers have to meet standards of a lower level than what we meet here in this country. There may be standards of sanitation or safety or efficiency which are lower than what we have to meet, which reduce the cost there. And as I say, in some cases, in the area particularly of state-owned economies and state-operated economies, there are, there, there are ways in which that export product can be directly subsidized. Well, I'm very strongly opposed to that kind of unfair competition, and I believe that uh, the government should have the authority to retaliate and to uh, negotiate in order to try to get relief for you uh, so that you will not be faced with that kind of competition. At the same time, I believe that we should allow the doors of trade to stay open to the extent that we want to be able to maintain the prosperity of American production. Of course, we here in this part of the country are very heavy producers of uh, farm commodities and export. For example, about three quarters of our soybean production in this country goes overseas. And I don't want us to get into a very short term and short sighted restrictions upon American exports, uh, which will backfire on us, which really won't produce what we want, really won't end up lowering the price of the commodity to the consumer, but in fact will end up with that foreign buyer going someplace else to buy the commodity. We've seen that happen in several instances where uh, foreign buyers who needed American exports were denied them and they have simply cultivated new sources uh, for those exports and we have ended up in a worse spot than we were before we initiated this kind of action. So it's a, it's a difficult kind of question to cope with and uh, it's a hard balance to work out. But I can assure you that we're doing our best to protect your jobs from unfair and discriminatory foreign competition, at the same time trying to maintain the, the vigor, the strength, the, the uh, vitality of the American economy, because your survival, your well-being depends also upon uh, good export markets for our products. The balance of payments of this country depends upon it. That's one of the real causes of the inflation we've got today, is, is the balance of payments is worse and worse. Of course, you know what has happened during this administration is they've had to devalue 
our currency twice because the balance of payments got so bad. And of course, when they devalued the currency, that just made inflation worse because that devaluation of the American dollar meant that the foreigner found the American product cheaper, which meant a much greater demand for American production, uh, food, fibers, manufactured goods, and everything else. And at the same time, it meant that for everything we must export from abroad, it would cost consequently more. So those two devaluations fed the flames of inflation still further. And uh, uh, so this, this is the, the kind of the kind of problem that we've gotten ourselves into with, with balance of payments. So I'm, I'm simply asking you to consider the importance of, of balance in terms of our foreign trade policy. Now, since I've been in Congress, I personally have been very pleased and happy to sponsor a uh, great many bills that I think have, have been of value to working Americans. I've uh, sponsored and supported uh, a great many education bills that have been designed to provide our young people with better educational opportunities, including student loan programs and research in higher education, library construction, school lunches, vocational and technical training, and various kinds of manpower training programs that are so important to industry, help for handicapped children with learning difficulties. And this year, we were able to get an Elementary and Secondary Education Act passed that had the very best Title I formula for our state that we've had in history. At the same time, I've supported uh, veterans benefit programs, including the new GI education bill. Uh, and frankly, I, I really do believe that the administration could better spend its time and our tax money on helping our hardworking and patriotic veterans and in wringing its hands too severely over amnesty for draft dodgers and deserters. But uh, as I say, that's a difficult national problem, and I realize that there, 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 are, there, there, there are good, strong arguments to be made on both sides of it. Uh, I had an opportunity, as you may know, some months back to appear on national television on the Today Show and debate that question. And uh, I defended the anti-amnesty position. One of my colleagues from New York took the other side. And uh, I'd say that the overwhelming uh, bulk of my mail supported the position I took. And uh, I'd say that uh, there is a, uh, this is a kind of area that we have to be extremely careful getting into. Uh, if we are going to jeopardize the uh, security of this nation at a future date, at a time we may need to resort to uh, an effective system of conscri conscription uh, for simple short-term advantages now, I don't think, I think we've simply got to, got to consider it carefully, we've got to go at it cautiously, and I certainly hope that the administration will take that approach. Uh, that does not happen to be an issue where we in the Congress have a direct role because the president has a constitutional authority in that area, and he's chosen to exercise it. We just hope that uh, he'll, uh, he'll exercise it wisely. Uh, I am personally very pleased that Congress has passed a bill to protect the private pension plans of millions of hardworking Americans. I worked hard for it, supported it, and I think uh, we've got a sound piece of legislation on the statute books. Uh, uh, it, it's gone a long way toward providing fiscal solvency for the retirement program for, for all working Americans. We've also passed some railroad retirement legislation that uh, uh, unfortunately our president saw fit to veto. To give you a little idea of what goes on in Washington sometime, you, uh, I've had people ask me recently, I said, well, why, why did Congress override the president's veto of the railroad retirement legislation? I thought he was, he's just trying to save the country some money and trying to fight inflation. Well, I pointed out that, <clears throat> that in the kind of monkey business that goes on up in Washington, what the president did as soon as he vetoed that legislation was to turn around and advise his White House congressional liaison staff people to make sure that the Congress overrode his veto. In other words, the White House congressional liaison staff were working with Republican members of Congress to make sure that, that the bill, that the veto got overridden. Uh, the bill, the override vote, was, the president got only one vote in the Senate and I think he got eight votes in the House of Representatives to sustain his veto. In other words, he's saying, all right, fellas, I'm going to veto this, but look, we're going to be in a hell of a fix if you don't get this thing overridden. So that's just about what it comes down to. It doesn't really give you a lot of faith in American political institutions when you have shenanigans such as that going on. But that is precisely what happened. I know from contacts that I have within the White House as well as Republican members of the House who told me precisely what the White House strategy was. So. 
that's that's just a part of the kind of the political monkey business that occasionally goes on and I think there's probably a lot that has emanated from the White House in these last few weeks and months that probably is related to electioneering more than anything else. And uh, that's the kind of way to have you take and eat it too. Let them say they were for cutting spending, want to veto a, an important retirement bill, but at the same time they don't want to make sure that that veto sticks. They want to make sure that the folks actually get the program. So you can pass judgment on that as you see fit. Uh, I've uh, also worked for the passage of legislation to provide economic development and public works and flood control programs to give us a sounder economy. I've supported better health and medical care programs, including Hilburton Hospital construction, community mental health centers, better housing programs, uh, improved social security and Medicaid benefits, and other programs to help our senior citizens and retirees. Uh, I also happen to serve, in addition to being on the Agriculture Committee, as a member of the Merchant Marine and Fisheries Committee. And uh, I've tried to do the best I could for our, our boiler makers and others who are uh, involved in shipbuilding industry in this country. Uh, we have a program that I think is very sound to provide uh, a degree of government support for shipbuilding in this country to ensure that this country does continue to have a merchant marine. Now, there are those who say that we shouldn't do it, and that a competition just simply drives the American shipbuilders out of business, well, that's, uh, that's just tough. Let the foreign countries build them all. Well, I prayed if we ever got into a war and needed uh, shipping to keep this country alive, we'd be in terrible fix if we didn't have a merchant marine. So I'm very pleased to support that program and also one to provide a, to guarantee a minimal level of support for American shipping to ensure that seafarers and others uh, of this country are maintained with uh, at least a, a, a modest base of support uh, simply because there are a number of other countries who do the same thing. In other words, there are others who require that uh, certain percentages of their shipping be carried in their own ships. I think we are certainly entitled to do the same in order to meet the kind of competition that we've seen from abroad. Well, it's been an interesting two years in the Congress and I want to thank you for uh, playing a very active and important role in enabling me to be there. I uh, have found it a fascinating challenge. I want to thank you for your support. Uh, of course, we're in the midst now of a, of a re-election campaign. I would be most grateful for any assistance you might be able to give us. Uh, in talking with uh, several of our friends outside before we came in, uh, they mentioned that uh, I believe they wanted to contact those of you who are from the 2nd Congressional District for a, for a caucus, for a meeting after this morning's program. Unfortunately, I must uh, go back immediately to make three more speeches today up in my district, and I will not be able to stay with you for that meeting, but I, I want to give you my best wishes and say hello to all of you who are, who are from my district. And uh, at the same time, I believe that uh, we are all working together here in Mississippi. I try to do the best I can for all the people of our state. And of course, the way they keep shifting these district lines around, you never know who you're going to be representing next. So. Uh, I want to tell any of you in the labor movement in this state that if I can ever do anything to be of assistance to you in Washington, I want you to call on me. Uh, I enjoy working with you. I appreciate your support, and I want to do everything I can to stand behind you. So with your help, two weeks from today, uh, you'll give me the mandate to go back to Washington to continue to work to keep America strong and free and prosperous. Thank you very much. that you are here. We sincerely hope that you're successful in your re-election efforts. I can assure you that the trade union movement's going to be in, in there doing what they can to help you maintain that seat. At the same time, we're going to see if we can't send another Democrat or two to Congress to help you out a little bit. Yeah. I think you'll be interested in knowing if we took a poll of the delegates before you got here, and we didn't have the first vote for a Republican for president of this country. We, we, we recognize what the problem is, and we feel that if we can get you up there for two more, two more years, that perhaps you can start th seeing things our way a little bit better. Thank you so much. <laughs> make a couple of announcements before we bring the next speaker in. Uh, 
Somebody with a green fire bird. <clears throat> Got it? That metal rock. Brother Knight wants to make an announcement. Brother Fitzhugh, Chairman of the Constitution Bylaws Committee, had just asked that I announce that he'd like to see his committee in one of the conference rooms at 1.30. That's the Constitution and Bylaws Committee. Now, I know we're running a little bit behind, and this thing looks like it might get even a little more congested, but we have a certain number of things to do, and it's very important that we do this. Now, after we have adjourned here for lunch, We'd like to ask all delegates from the second congressional district, Congressman Bowen's district, to meet us up at the front of the hall. Now that's, it's gonna cut your lunch out or some, but this is something that we have to do. All delegates from the second congressional district meet us here right after adjournment for lunch. This is very important. Now one other thing. This afternoon, you may miss lunch, you know, but After the Ladies and gentlemen, we are privileged to have with us today a very important member of the, of the Mississippi Senate, <laughs> Senator Perry, <clears throat> is President Pro Tem of the Mississippi Senate. By virtue of this fact, is one of, one of the most influential members of that body. Senator is an old friend of ours. Anytime we have a piece of legislation that we have an interest in, Senator Perry is always there on our side. He's assisted us on numerous occasions in securing passage of legislation beneficial to our people. I ask him to come before this convention, give him an opportunity to have a few words to say to you because I understand that perhaps he would like to do something other than being pro tem of the Senate. Those remarks, it's my pleasure to present to you Senator Bob Perry. Thank you, Mr. President. It's indeed a pleasure for me to be back before this convention. I believe it was year before last when I spoke to the convention last. <clears throat> I feel like I'm definitely among friends because being from a a family of uh, railroad men in northwest Mississippi, uh, <clears throat> I am at home. I'm not going to give a, a full length speech. I just want to, to raise up to you some concerns which I have and some observations, because I know that uh, you're behind schedule and also it's time to eat. <clears throat> That's most important to all of us. Several years ago, President Johnson talked to our nation and said this, this nation, this generation, in this hour has man's first chance to build a great society, a place where the meaning of man's life matches the marvels of man's labor. This was a very meaningful statement. At the time it was spoken, no question about the fact that we could make great strides in our society, socially and otherwise. But something has happened. The train has left the track, in my estimation. That we may be going into a greater society, but there are other things that are causing great alarm. And amongst these other things are the economy, which 
each and every person here has heard speaker after speaker talk about the seriousness of inflation. No question about it. You and I experience it every time we go to the grocery store, every time we drive into the gas station. It's a real viable issue with all of us. But what are we going to do about it? I have the wind button on. You know, it's made in my county. We could, we could get them. The fact is that if we don't have the will to win in this inflationary fight, if we don't have the will to speak out about things that, is, that are really causing this inflationary trend, then we're going to be saddled with it. We're going to be saddled with worse things than this. You recall that Will Rogers once said in the Great Depression days, last year we said things can't go on like this. And they didn't. They just got worse. And that's precisely what we were told last year, a temporary measure. I'm telling you that the indicators that I have seen, both federal and state, as a member of the Budget Commission, tells me that it's not going to be a great upswing in the immediate future. That we're going to have several more months, six, eight, 10, 12 months, of just what we're experiencing at the present time before things begin to look better. Because a lot more people have to be convinced that the cabinet officer who recently said that the people who were really hurt by inflation and the status of the economy at the present time were the Wall Street brokers. I disagree with this. It's wrong. All you have to do is come to my district where the utility rates have, gone, have almost tripled in Northwest Mississippi and you'll find out that those people are hurt because some of my own constituents and some of my clients cannot even pay the doctor bill because they're too busy trying to keep the lights on in their home. Things will get better. I'm not trying to paint for you a very dismal picture to upset you. I just want you to understand that we understand the situation at the state level. We are con going to continue to do what we can to alleviate the burdens of our people. The optimist proclaims that we live in the best of all possible worlds, but the pessimist fears that this is true. We want to wipe out the fear. But how we wipe out the fear is not by pushing people aside and saying it's not really true. No. We wipe out the fear by constructive measures to raise the economy. I heard that uh, this past week that the unemployment level in Mississippi was about 4.7. My information from the people that should know, it's in excess of 5%. It's rising. What are we going to do about that? One of the things we should do is go out and, and get, by marshalling our assets, a good one is to bring the revenue sharing funds back into Mississippi as an investment and invest them in the people and in better jobs simply by making available money for our people. The banks must have a certain amount of money to remain liquid, to take care of current obligations. We can use this 80 odd million dollars to stimulate our economy further. And I think we're going to do that. I think that you're going to see the governor do this in the very near future. As we look and view our troubles, I'm reminded of what Oliver Wendell Holmes said, that trouble creates a capacity to handle it. The people in this room can handle it, but only us collectively can tell the people in Washington, the Federal Power Commission, that utility rates are higher. 
Only those of us in this room can assume the obligation by caring for the idea that we must have a stable economy and it's going to have to be done. A stable economy we need for new housing, for new jobs, and for education. Education at all levels. In Mississippi, what we need as much as any single thing is not another Blue Ribbon Committee on education, but educators who know what they're doing to tell us where we're going wrong and maybe spending too much money, but evaluate the education from start to finish, from kindergarten through the doctoral program, so we're getting the maximum dollars worth. Legislators can't make that survey. Only the people in it, just like the people here, when you talk about the economy, the laboring people of Mississippi, the farmers who are out digging the trenches, who are planting and mil milking the cows, they're the people that can tell us exactly what's wrong and give us the constructive solutions for it. Alexander Hamilton is charged with the responsibility of coming up with the phrase of the tax system called the put and take. You know how it is. The taxpayer puts it in and the politician takes it out. This is the way it's been. What we're going to have to do is going to have to reassess the politician's role also. Watergate has been a traumatic experience for every one of us in this nation. It's just like a cancer on our society. But if we don't profit for it now since we've had it, we deserve to have more of them. This brings me to my concluding remarks. That I believe that whilst individuals were responsible for Watergate, I believe you and I must assume some of that responsibility also. Many is the time we've elected a public official, be it on the county level, city level, state level, or national level, and sent him on to do our bidding. But we never told him precisely what he should do. We've never bothered ourselves in the last 100 years, just about, in particular the last 50 years, of checking to see what was going on. If the straw was minded in the best possible fashion. My friends, we have reaped the benefits of turning our elected officials loose. It's been my experience in my nearly 12 years of public service that the number of public officials who were doing wrong was so small in comparison to the good that so many were doing. But the fact is that that one rotten apple in the barrel has soured it for all the good people, the dedicated people that have worked so hard for education, worked so hard for the many things in Mississippi and in this nation. I believe that that you and I are going to have to pledge again what our founding fathers said in the Declaration of Independence, that we pledge our lives, our fortunes, whatever they may be, and our sacred honor to uphold the ideals of this country. If they're not worth pledging for, they're not worth anything. Time was when a man stepped up to cast his ballot. Three people were seated at the table. You shouted the name of the person you were going to vote for. But it didn't stop there. Because if he did wrong, you went to wherever he was and you shouted to him that he was wrong. But you also, when he was doing right, you shouted praise to him. In our everyday life, we see the need of commitment. Commitment to moral obligations, which we have. Commitment to our family and to our friends. Because if we don't have friends, life isn't worth the living. I conclude with a story that was told, and I, I'm, some of you may have heard it before. 
that this Englishman was in the United States in the early years and wanted to meet or wanted to see George Washington, the great general. And one day he was, he was with this editor, and he says, well, there he is, right there. That's George Washington. That's George Washington. Where are his guards? And the editor said, I'm his guard. He's the symbol of the nation. He is our ideal. His office is, maybe not the man, but I am his God. My friends, if you and I do not obligate ourselves today anew, that we're the guardian of liberty, and we're the guardian of the economy, we're the guardian of the people, then what's left for us? Not too much, is it? I think that today is the time to speak out again for our commitment to society, for a better life for everyone. <coughs> we can achieve it. I'm an optimist. I've always been an optimist. I believe that this little wind button here is not going to do a single thing, but maybe some of the people I see and some of the people with whom I come in contact will get the spirit, the spirit that has, has led in the labor movement since the turn of the century, where we are dedicated to helping all people for that better tomorrow. And we're going to achieve it <coughs> together. And all of these bad things that, that have happened and are possibly going to happen, we can withstand. Simply because of the moral fiber to a commitment. May God grant to each of us the will to move forward in the cause of our people in this state, in this nation, and this world of ours. Thank you. Very much, Senator Perry. I regret very much that we got a little behind schedule and that uh, you didn't feel that you should give us the benefit of all of your thinking here this morning. But we do appreciate your presence, and we do appreciate the good work you've been doing in the Senate. We want to wish you the best of luck and come back and see us anytime you can. Okay? Thank you. We share your views on many, many subjects. I assume that you're wearing that win button. You're thinking about winning some kind of a future political office. Not that you agree with the President Ford all that much on his program, right? I seldom agree. With <laughs> all right, we have now reached the point of <clears throat> recession for lunch. We do have a few announcements to make. Uh, I've been asked to announce that IBEW would like to have a caucus and uh, what is that, Ballista B? It's one of the... Bella Vesta B. Bella, how you pronounce that, Joe? Bella Vesta. Bella Vesta B. That's back in the corner over there as soon as we adjourn. And of course, Brother Knight has already announced that he'd like to have the all delegates from the second congressional district remain and come to the front of the hall for a few minutes is upon adjournment. Do we have any other announcements? Uh, where is, is Brother Sabo still in the audience? Sabo with the Department of Labor, has he left yet? No. Sabo, has he left? George Sabo. Assume that he has left, I was going to try to afford him an opportunity to <coughs> advise you that the U.S. Department of Labor, his department, the Apprentice Bureau, is accepting application for jobs with his department. And I wanted him to make that announcement. I guess we got behind schedule and he had to leave. But if he's outside, tell him I made it for him. Do we have any other announcements? Oh, Mr. 
rubber workers meet back here in the back. Meet the rubber workers want to caucus in the back upon adjournment. Hopefully there will be a few of you left that move to the front of the room for the 2nd Congressional District Caucus. See you back here at 1.30 sharp. Convention, please come to order. Before we <clears throat> begin the regular order of business, and that's the showing of the farm workers' film, we got a couple of things we want to do. We have a shotgun and a Bible to give away. I don't know. I don't know which uh, comes first, the shotgun or the Bible. Where is the? Uh, Want somebody here from the machinist uh, union that's raffling off the shotgun? Are they ready? Huh? Printing more tickets? Uh, brother, where's Brother Turner? We wanted to try to get this done uh, before the day is over. After we get through uh, this afternoon, we go into the election of officers. We'll have to recess until the banquet will be tomorrow before we can do that. Where is Brother C.B. Turner? I guess he's trying to find the machinist with the box, I guess. Anyhow, I'm going to go ahead and introduce uh, Brother Dan Askew to you, who has been outside resting people for the Memorial Bibles. I'd like to afford him an opportunity to have a few words to say, and after he's had a few words to say, then we'll have the drawing for the Bible. Brother Askew. I'd like to, to say that it's indeed a privilege to be here with you, and we appreciate your inviting us to come and take part in your convention this year. And I know it's been several years since we've been here, and some of the locals are, may not be familiar with us and the service that we provide. And I want to assure you that we are here to serve you, and we appreciate the opportunity we've had to serve so many of the locals through the years. If you haven't had a chance to come by and visit with us, take our literature back home with you, please feel free to do that. If you don't uh, have our service in your local, we have free sample copies that, uh, that you can take back to your executive board. We're proud to be a 100% union organized company, and we have the union label, the Allied Printing Trades label in all of our Bibles, the Carpenter's label on all of our cedar cases. So we're very proud of that. I want to thank you for registering for the drawing for the two family Bibles. And now uh, Loretta Hunter has agreed to have the Aluminum Workers Local 202 to help me with the drawing and appreciate that very much. And so we're going to have the drawing for the two family Bibles. And if you are the winner, I wish you'd stand and be recognized if you're in the hall. If the person's name that I called is not in the hall and you, you know that person, please have them come by the display and, and uh, claim their Bible because I'll have to leave here in a few minutes. I've got to, uh, I hate to leave, but I'm going to have to leave and go over to the uh, Georgia State uh, AFL-CIO convention in the morning. This is uh, Willie uh, Owens, president of IUE Local 665 in Jackson. Present. Thank you, Mr. Owens. All right. <laughs> Stanley Smith, IBEW Local 1816. Thank you again very much for taking part uh, in the drawing. 
And we'll look forward to being here with you again in two years at your next convention. And thank you, Ms. Hunter, for, for helping with the drawing. <coughs> very much, uh, Brother Askew. We appreciate you being here and all of the cooperation we received from you. Especially appreciative of the Bibles that you've made available to us to give to the ministers every day as they gave the invocation. About the machinists, are they ready to draw for the shotgun? If they're not, then we're going <clears> to <throat> go right ahead and uh, show the farm workers film. After the film, we have Mr. Gilbert Padelia. Secretary Treasurer of the Farm Workers Organization here, and he'd like to have a few words to say about the farm workers' struggle. And after that, we're going to ask Mr. Ordman of the Union Labor Department to talk about the importance of buying union made goods. And then after that, you'll hear from the Honorable Theodore Smith. Okay, will somebody get the lights? Wait a minute. You got him? Huh? All right. Step up here and tell him. The Constitution and Bylaws Committee will meet with Brother Fitzhugh where? First room. First room down the hall. Constitution and Bylaws. No machinist. No shotgun. Somebody turn off the lights. <laughs> turn off the lights for the shotgun ride. <laughs> there we go. Bible and a shotgun and get the lights off. We introduced ourselves. Is the one election the growers cannot stand. this time to get the people up here to have the drawing for the shotgun. I think perhaps you ought to have the drawing and send it out there. What do you think? <clears throat> I think they need the shotgun. Anyhow, we'll do that <clears throat> a few minutes later. I told you in advance of the film that the Secretary Treasurer of the Farm Workers Union was here with us. We'd like to afford him an opportunity to have a few words to say about this situation. At this time, it's my pleasure to present to you Mr. Gilbert Padilla, Secretary Treasurer of the Farm Workers. Brother Padilla. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Brother Ramsey. And I want to tell you how pleased I am giving me this opportunity to be here with you and talk to you about some of our problems. But before I start, I'd like you to uh, meet, if you haven't met, or introduce to you our staff representative in the state of Mississippi, Rick Abraham, who was handling the film. Rick, will you send out so they can know who you? <clears throat> what you saw in this film is just 17 minutes of three months of struggle last year, but we already have about 5,000 people arrested and there were 400 people wounded and 20 severely wounded and 28 people shot at and of course two people killed. This is just part of what happened and what's happening today. But in spite of what you saw in the film today, they're not going to scare the farm workers of America in this, from those fields. Today, this very year, we have had more strikes this year, 1974, than we had in the history of our union. We have strikes in Arizona, Yuma Valley, in the Lemons, who's been a 100% effective, been successful not to let the illegals cross from Mexico. We have strikes in the avocados in California, on the tomatoes, on the oranges, on the strawberries, and the grapes. More strikes. They're not going to, we're not going to get frightened by what you saw here today or what beatings, we're not going to get frightened. I wanted to tell you that in spite of all you've seen in the film, our boycott today is probably much more successful than it was in 1969 and 1970. More support this time around than we had last year or, or the year before or in the 1960s. This year, as you know, we got the full support of the FFL-CIO Executive Council. We got all the full support of all the independent unions such as the UAW and the mine workers. Last November, the Catholic bishops met in Washington and endorsed our boycott. 
We got support from the three denominations of the Jewish community, the Jewish religions. And last week, Cesar Chavez went aboard, went to England, Germany, Switzerland, Geneva, and got tremendous support on the boycott. Went all the way to Rome and got the support. You know who he saw in Rome, went up and visited the, the Pope. The Pope gave Cesar Chavez a 15-minute audience in support of the farm worker struggle in the United States. We got the support. I wanted to tell you that Mississippi is a very important state to us, and the boycott in Mississippi is very important. And what I have seen of the boycott in Mississippi is tremendous, and the work that Rick has done here in Mississippi, getting the support and cooperation from uh, McCarthy's, was it Wallman Brothers, Wallman's, getting that kind of a support, getting the support from labor that he's been getting from you, and getting some chainsaws here in Mississippi to cooperate and sell scab grapes. And as I visit here in the South this last two days, I found that Jack in Mississippi is probably the only city that's selling Union grapes. And that's an accomplishment for you people here in the state of Mississippi. I wanted to tell you that in order to understand why we struggle the way we struggle, first you have to understand that farm labor in this country do not enjoy the rights that all of you enjoy. That we don't come under the National Labor Relations Act. That we don't have minimum wage. That we don't have unemployment insurance compensation. And in many states, we don't have workmen's compensation. And there's no such thing as child labor law. And in this country today, with the support that we have, and the support of you in this room, there's some statistics we have to change that the life expectancy of farm labor in this country is 49 years. That the average education for farm labor is grade school. If you were born a boy in a farm worker family, you go to the seventh grade. If you were born a girl, you go to the fifth grade. That thousands of workers die of pesticides yearly. All of these statistics are not union statistics, but labor department statistics that 800,000 children under the age of 16 years of age labor in the fields today in this United States. And the problem isn't only in California, as you saw in the film, but in Georgia, where we're having a strike, in Florida, where we had a couple of strikes. The problem is in Mississippi, as well as in Connecticut and the state of New York, or in South Jersey, the eastern seaboard of Maryland and Virginia, that those conditions exist today and that we're going to change them. We need your support. We need your help. We need you in the picket lines. We need you to inform informational pickets, leafleting, here in the state and your communities. We're asking and urging you in your central labor councils to form a committee, a boycott committee, to assist Rick in his work in Mississippi. We need that support. And believe me, we're going to win. Rick have a picket line this afternoon at Sunflower. You'll get the information as you go out as to where and the time. I'm here to ask you and to thank you for the past support. But in spite of the fact that we had the whole administration against us, Mr. Colson, before he saw Christ, was the instigator of destroying our union. Mr. Kleindish and all of the Farm Bureau who came to destroy us. And right now, the opposition is a big Teamster organization. The Teamsters, the Farm Bureau, the Growers Association, and all the right-wing elements. But in spite of all that, brothers and sisters, in spite of all that, perhaps next year, if you invite me to your convention, I'm going to stand beside, behind, in front of you, and I'm going to say that we have won because we are going to win with the support of labor. Thank you. Are we ready for the shotgun drawing? You want to do it now? You want to take, draw the shotgun? Is the one who agreed to send it to California, the sister farm workers union? All in favor of that motion, signify it to say an aye. 
Oppose, motion carried and so ordered that one of the shotgun will send it out to California. <laughs> we will afford the <clears throat> delegates here an opportunity to make a contribution to the to this most most worthy cause, and I'd like to ask the sergeant at arms if they would to get somebody's hat and Let's take up a collection for this gentleman while he's here. I got five dollars I'd like to drop in it as a starter. I realize, of course, that we are <clears throat> we're taking up, we Senator Smith might think we're taking up some of his time, but I assure you, Brother Smith, once you get started, we're gonna let you go. Uh, we realize that TV people haven't all got here yet. They are not all set up, so we want to make sure they're here before you start. Who's got that hat? You was late yesterday. I see you on time today. The press is here. You, they expect to get a good story out of the next speaker, I suspect. Who's got the hat? Let's circulate a box or a hat or something here. Let's do it now. Come on here. Here's mine. Yeah, Rick. Hey, come man, get mine. Rick? If there's not in the audience yet, I don't think we'll get him in here in a few minutes. Are uh, we going to wait till things are just right for him? Don't get over anxious. Uh, everybody's not ready for him yet. We got another gentleman yet that I want to give a few minutes to. Could I have your attention for a half a minute, please? We have Brother Ordman representing the union label department of the FFL-CIO with us today. And I'd ask him to come up and have a few words to say about the importance of buying union-made goods. Uh, we wanted to give the primary emphasis here today to the farm workers' struggle. But at the same time, we want to do what we can to ask all of you to buy union-made goods, such as menswear. We have a lot of clothing workers in the audience, makes men's suits, men's shirts, and what have you. And we think it's important that you buy goods produced by these people as well as boycott grapes and lettuce. Brother Ordman. Thank you, Claude, very much. I appreciate these few moments to come by and say hello to you and bring the greetings of the Union Label and Service Trades Department of the AFL-CIO. We, of course, want to express to you our deep appreciation to all of the delegates and their families who have demonstrated by their ardent demand for union-made goods and selection of unionized services and deliveries that they believe not only in the principles of collective bargaining, but in the practice of collective buying. My friends, the union label, <clears throat> the symbol found on the foods and products made by the men and women of the American labor movement is taking on an increasing insignificance. Significance, rather, I should say. In the present day and age, it is no longer sufficient to exhort the American consumer to buy American. What we have to do now, ladies and gentlemen, is to urge them to buy union. <clears throat> the reason that many of the goods and products which are considered American are far from being all American. Each day we see or read of another U.S. company closing down its operation here and reopening in a foreign country. And yes, each, each day these United States companies export more and more technological expertise. They leave this country, mind you, and in their wake, leave hundreds and even thousands of working men and women unemployed. 
at a time when the unemployment rolls are already swollen to an unacceptable state. They close their doors and leave with a seemingly complete disregard for the well-being of the individuals affected. Oh yes, they go to a foreign country, whether it be Taiwan, Hong Kong, or wherever, and set up shop there employing cheap labor and contributing to the economy of whatever country it may be. And they do this, they do this for one reason, and one reason only, profits. They just want to line their own pockets a little more, and don't let anybody tell you differently. Because when they leave this country, there is one facet of their operation they leave intact, mind you, and that is their marketing apparatus. Oh yes, they'll go to a foreign country, employ cheap labor, but still manage to get an American price for that product. In all of this, my friends, all of this is done in the name of profits. Well, Looking beyond profits, we can see proven dangers in this process. A continuation of it threatens to destroy, yes, destroy, the American standard of living, which is the greatest ever achieved by man on this earth. <clears throat> oh, yes, some corporate executives attempt to blame, to prove, to place the blame on unions and their unceasing struggle for a fair share of America's richness as their reason for fleeing to foreign countries where they enrich the people of other lands and line their own pop pockets with profits. But unions, unions here today must be prepared for these attacks. And one of the best fortifications against them is the purchase only of goods bearing the union label. Because for that union member, buying union label not only makes good sense economically, but it gives the entire trade union movement the opportunity to, opportunity to fight back in the marketplace of public opinion. Oh yes, buying union is often criticized as a misguided act. Well, my friends, we see it. We see it as an act of survival. We have long, oh yes, very long, for many years, have urged consumers to buy union. Everything from the clothes on their back to the dishes on their tables. <coughs> We're not against imports. The AFL-CIO has never been against imports. Trade with other nations, my friends, yes, is necessary, and it is fine as long as all factors of trade are fair. And union-made goods will stand up to any comparison. We feel, however, that union-made goods have far more value than their own intrinsic worth. For one thing, for one thing alone, they mean jobs. And all of us here today now know how important jobs are. There, uh, there simply are not enough jobs available in this country. But as long as a manufacturer can sell his wares, his employees will remain employed. He will not be tempted to go foreign. That's an economic fact of life. And jobs are part 
of what the American labor movement is all about. Buying union-made goods also means money in the American economy. Because, my friends, no nation, no nation will long survive when its money goes overseas in greater quantity than foreign money comes in. <coughs> when union members and their families purchase products and services offered by fellow trade unionists, they are, in effect, giving a vote of confidence to this country's trade union movement. So my friends, in conclusion, we here today hold a key to these problems in our union pay envelopes, and they determine resolve to be union and to buy union labor. And I also know that as trade unionists, to get the job done takes initiative and it takes firm leadership. It also takes experience. You, ladies and gentlemen, have that. It also takes tools such as information and education. That is where your organization can play a very vital role. And yes, as practical people, we also know that the job before us is by no means easy. To get it done will not only take our best skills, but will also take much patience and dedicated effort. And it will take time. We best can do this job together. For as trade unionists, we hold to our trade union way. Together we strive, and together we gain. Thank you so much. Now, if I can get the girl up here with a shotgun, we're going to give that away next. I'm going to get to you, Senator. Don't give us out. <laughs> Just want to make sure everybody believes that we do have a shotgun. <laughs> Are you going to perform the service here? No, sir. Lady from AFT is going to draw. Miss Towery with the Machinist Union is now going to ask Miss Rodford. Rodford with the Teachers Union to do the drawing. Camera on, get a shot of this, giving a shotgun away here. Yeah. <laughs> Jack Speed, Jackson, Mississippi. Jack Speed, Jackson, Mississippi. What you gonna do, Jack? There he is, he's a sergeant in arms coming this way. Jack, you wanna come up here and get the shotgun and fondle it for a few minutes before you send it to California? <laughs> Jack, I was just kidding you about sending it to California. That's uh, mighty for you and the Secretary of Treasury the Farm Workers Union to work out. with us this afternoon, one of our best friends in the state legislature, and he advised me here a few days ago that he was our best friend, period, when we were talking about him addressing this convention. 
talked a little bit about him coming over and addressing the convention. He'd already found out that I was going to invite the lieutenant governor to address the convention. <clears throat> and I had a problem. The problem was that I had to make sure I didn't get uh, the lieutenant governor and Senator Smith in the same room at the same time. <laughs> yeah, a few months back, he advocated in abolishing the governor of the lieutenant, uh, the office of the lieutenant governor, and I didn't want him to start advocating that in the presence of the lieutenant governor. Senator Smith has been saying some things in recent years that needed to be said. And you should have on the tables in front of you, at least we put it out this morning, a reproduction of a newspaper article, an editorial, if you please, about some of Senator Smith's statement, statements about the need of getting people serving in the legislature off of boards and commissions that should be part of the executive department of our state government. He's been invited here today as chairman of the Senate Pub Public Health and Welfare Committee. But I advised him when I invited him that we didn't expect him to talk about just those things considered by his committee when the Senate's in session. So with those few remarks, it's my pleasure to present to you at this time Senator Theodore Smith of Corinth, Mississippi. Senator Smith. Thank you very much, Claude. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm deeply grateful for your kind introduction. I am especially grateful for the group that led me to this podium. They're from my hometown, my home area. And I've been following them and they've been following me for a number of years. And I'm deeply grateful for their friendship and their confidence and the help that they have given me in the past. As one of them stated, I, I try to tell it like it is. And I guess I first ought to tell it, the first thing, you know. You know, the, the staff of President Ford went out to the Smoky Mountains near deer hunting the other day, and they went out there to hunt game and shows you how smart they are. A lady streaker came running through the woods, and one of the hunters said, are you game? And she said, yes, and he shot her. We also have a great Department of Agriculture up in Washington that's just about bankrupt the farmers and also bankrupt the people. I regret to tell you that two of the members of the Secretary of Agriculture, Earl Butts, got, got killed the other day. They were drinking and they got died while they were drinking milk. The cow fell on them. But I came here to talk to you about some very serious matters. I'm worried. I'm worried for you and for me and for my children and for my grandchildren. I'm worried about the finest nation in the world, the United States of America. I had the privilege of serving in the United States Air Force for 26 years and visited practically every country in the world and every state in this union. And I concluded that this was the greatest place after looking at them, that mankind has ever organized a government, but I think we're in trouble. Not so long ago, the Associate Justice of the Supreme Court, Justice Harry Blackman, made a speech 
and Justice Blackmun was one of those conservatives that were appointed by President Nixon. But even he said, among other things, in the speech, and I quote, he said, the very glue of our ship of state seems to have come unstuck. Lawrence M. Gould reminds us that 19 of 21 civilizations that have been known in history died from within and not from aggression from without. But what is the picture today? <clears throat> we have accumulated such a debt in America that it is almost unbelievable. They simply numb the mind. And then we talk about retrenchment. One trillion dollars in corporate debt, six hundred billion dollars in mortgage debt, five hundred billion dollars in U.S. government debt, two hundred billion dollars in state and local government debt, two hundred billion dollars in consumer debt. Consumer debt has increased more than 50% since 1970 and more than 3,500% since 1946. Housing starts have declined 45% in the past two years. The prices of bank stocks are now lower in relation to earnings and book value than they were on Friday, March the 3rd, 1933, the day the bank holidays were declared. <coughs> the, the columnist that wrote this says, we don't have a bank holiday today, but we already have a bank holiday stock market. Inflation is 12% during the past year, and I put here in my notes that it's estimated to be 10% next year, but on the radio coming out here today, it said that based on last month, the rate would exceed 12% again next year, the highest in 28 years. Thomas E. Mullaney, writing in the Financial Week, stated that the government's key price index, a reliable precursor of what the consumer will have to pay for his food and other goods in the immediate months ahead, shot upward at the alarming annual rate of 44%. Unemployment is running at 5.8% today. 7% is expected before the end of next year. Six million people are unemployed. And somebody says, tighten your seatbelts. President Ford, I, I first, I, in talking about this, in how much it is cost in today's local paper, talking about the hunger and the critical condition of people in Mississippi, and they called his name and here's what this person said to him. Said to get things we need to live, we must do without. Said we have to do without clothes, and President Ford says, buy warm clothes. They can't buy any. And he said, why a pair of shoes has to last us three years, if you can believe, believe that. He said, to get enough to live on just barely exists. We have to cut a percentage on everything. We get maybe one of two, one or two packages of meat a month. My wife on medical orders is supposed to have milk three times a day and juice 
three times a day. We don't have any at all here now. President Ford suggests that we can solve these problems by merely wearing a wind button. Well, I read in the paper where a lady went down wearing nothing but a wind button at the supermarket store and the, and the sugar that she bought a year ago was at 71 cents for a five pound sack is now selling at $2.14 for the same five pound sack, wind button or no wind button. <laughs> Richard Scruggs, chief economist of Standard and Poor's Corporation, a major investment advisory concern says, and I quote, right now the stock market is, con is forecasting a depression with a capital D. President Ford canceled a $3 million grain sale to Russia to try to prevent $1 per loaf of bread but as soon as he went to Kansas City last week and he talked to Senator Dole, who is in serious political trouble, why he switched his mind and went ahead with the grain deal. It reminds me of the big giant of a man about six foot four, walked into the hardware store and said, I want to buy half a joint of stovepipe. And the little clerk said, we don't sell half joints of stovepipe. We'll sell a whole joint and you can cut it in two. He said, I didn't come in here to get a lot of lip. I came in here to buy half a joint of stovepipe. He went back to the back of the store and said to the manager, said there's some damn fool up there that wants to buy half a joint of stovepipe. And about that time he looked up and this giant of a man was standing right behind him and he said, and this nice gentleman right here wants the other half. <laughs> President Ford was willing to cancel the grain, drain, grain sale until he talked to Senator Dole of Kansas. The price of automobiles have gone up a little over $1,000 in the past year. Everyone hears the cry that lets supply and demand settle all of these problems, lazy fast. Well, last year, the autom automobile manufacturers produced 9.4 million automobiles because the demand was there. And this year, they estimate 1.2 million less automobiles. In other words, the demand is less, but the price is $1,000 higher. And somebody tells me, let supply and demand solve all of these problems. It's all right for supply and demand to settle the price of the labor and so forth, but not how much the big automobile manufacturers get for their cars. Is a 1929 panic impossible? With the leadership in Washington, I sometimes wonder. Not according, if it is impossible, not according to the pessimistic polls now being taken by longtime financial forecaster Albert Sinlander. He working out of his well-reputed, and I'm reading a report here, he working out of his well-reputed firm in Pennsylvania says that American soundings have been assuming a negative attitude about the economy that is potentially ruinous. He says, I show a 20 to 30 percent decline in the consumer's belief in fiscal stability. This is the largest drop of confidence I've recorded in 20 years surveying. Normally, a 9 percent drop is considered serious so 20 to 30 percent is critical. I think it indicates a collapse. 
the price of gasoline has gone from 29 cents to 59 cents a gallon. Utility bills have doubled. The bonded indebtedness of the United States increased $65 billion in the last four years, and that's a greater increase than happened in the 12 years previous to these four years. Speaking of oil, those companies that have made more than 180% increase in profits, and then the energy, energy, energy czar put out rules and regulations that permitted the oil companies to do a lot of double dipping and accrued to them an excess profit of $40 million. And somebody began to dig something like the press people, and God bless them, but they began to dig out who wrote that order and who wrote that regulation. Would I'll tell you who. It was a man that was loaned to the energy, energy czar from Phillips Petroleum Corporation, and he wrote the order that brought about a $40 million excess profits to the big oil companies. Dr. Earl Butts, Secretary of Agriculture, I'd like to read you an editorial from the Commercial Appeal, and it certainly, I think, is a fine paper, but it's not one of those that you would say even liberal or radical. But, you know, Secretary Butts began to say that he was going to start a tour, kind of a tent show, try to tell the people that the price of food wasn't very high. Let me read you part of it. He said, Se Agriculture Secretary Butts, Butts is new chief of public relations, has cooked up a new scheme for him. As though Butts needed anybody to dream up new schemes for him. What the nation needs is his public relations chief tells him and us is Dr. Butts' traveling medicine show. Rolling through the countryside selling secretary's snake oil remedies to convince Americans that food prices really aren't as bad as they seem to think they are. Now we have heard some economists in Washington maintain that what this nation's economy needs is some old-time religion. Nobody has talked about traveling medicine shows. Said President Ford had better start looking around for a new agriculture secretary who understands he represents the national interest before Dr. Butt suggests we all try voodoo as a solution to our food shortage problems and high inflation. But, sec but President Ford has an answer. He tells people to clean their plates. Some old and poverty-stricken people throughout this nation of ours and in Mississippi are cleaning their plates of every crumb of cat and dog food that they can afford to buy because that's all they can afford. <laughs> he suggests that we buy warm clothes. And I just got through reading to you about how, how a person fared trying to buy warm clothes. He said, plant a wind garden. And then plant, then he says, put a surtax of 5%. Now, everybody noticed that because they were saying they were going to take 5% of everybody's income who's single of $7,500 and $15,000 for a family. But while he was taking 5% from the big vested interest, he gave them 10% depreciation allowance. In other words, he took $5 from them, but gave them back 10. Now that's a heck of a way to run a railroad. His suggestions, band-aids on cancerous conditions and salve on places 
that ought to be operated on. It reminds me of the fat lady that walked into the, into the bus station. She went over to the scales. She weighed about 360 pounds, and she waddled over to the scales, stepped up on them and put in her penny. Scales went round and around and back and forth and finally settled on 68 pounds. There's a drunk standing, by half, about half drunk standing behind her, and he shook his head and batted his eyes and said, well, I'll be damned, she's holler. <laughs> I'll tell you the panacea and the program that has been advocated by President Ford is as holler as that woman indicated she was. <laughs> but there were some things that President Ford didn't mention he left out of his program. He didn't mention that they were going to put some taxes on the oil companies that are ripping off the American public today and earning $3.6 billion more in profits than they did before this crisis came along. He didn't mention about the utilities that have doubled the prices in the last year. He didn't mention the bank interest rates that have gone so high that nobody can possibly buy a home. And he didn't mention the big loopholes in the tax structure and the laws of our nation that protects the big interest, he didn't mention them. He didn't mention the fact that there was a president that earned over $500,000 in one year and paid less than $800 federal income tax and no state income tax at all. He didn't mention the fact that, pre that Vice President-designate Rockefeller in 1970 earned $2.7 million in earned income and didn't pay a dime of federal income tax. But you try to get by with not paying your income tax and they'll put you under the jail. <clears throat> he failed to mention the monopolies that's ripping off the consuming public of this nation. And let me read from Business Week. It says three or four firms dominate sales, controlling the prices of the food that you and I buy. So Campbell sells 90% of the soup we buy. Kellogg, General Mills, General Foods, and Quaker Oats have cornered 90% of the breakfast cereal market. Del Monte is king of the fruit and vegetable canners. Gerber reigns over baby food, according to Russell C. Parker of the Federal Trade Commission. Fifty food processing companies account for more than 60% of food processing profits, and the trend toward concentration attributable almost entirely to mergers rather than internal expansion is continuing. In 1972, the Federal Trade Commission says the cost to the consumers of less than competitive pricing in 13 food industry lines exceeded $2 billion. At the retail level, 20 large chains made 40% of grocery store sales in 1970, up from 30% a decade ago. You know, though, the latest fad is to bite the bullet. That's what President Ford tells us. Well, Jerry Terhorst had served the president for about a month and then couldn't stomach it anymore, got out and he wrote a column the other day and he said, and I quote, the president didn't bite the bullet, he swallowed it. <laughs> the New York Times said, that he didn't bite the bullet. In fact, he didn't bite anything. He nibbled on a marshmallow. <laughs> the president also failed to suggest cutting down on the big payments to former President Nixon. 
Did you know that it's costing the taxpayers of the United States up to now, since he left office, $9,870 a day? I didn't say a month or a year. I said $9,870 a day to keep what some people call a crook out at San Clemente. Also, he didn't mention the fact that the Arab countries ripping us to pieces with gasoline hijacked oil prices. And while they are accumulating all of the wealth that there is just about in the world, President Ford continues to recommend to the Congress that we send to the Arab countries $370 million next year in foreign aid. And they're going to accumulate $60 billion excess profits in the next year on the increased oil prices. An article in Business Week says that in recent weeks, some utilities have had to pay $40 a ton and higher. At that level, coal is just as expensive as oil per energy unit. Now, the laboring people didn't bring that about. But did you know, as you know, most of the coal reserves in this nation are owned by the oil companies. After reviewing all of this, I am reminded of what President J Lyndon Johnson said about President Ford. And he said, President Johnson said he played football too long without a helmet. <laughs> I'm also reminded of the story of the American that was in the deepest part of Africa, and he was trying to teach one of the natives how to speak English. And he came up and he said, tree. And the natives said, tree. And then he went around and he found a little creek and he said, creek. And the native said, creek. And then they went around a little hedge and they saw a man and a woman making love. And he said, they're riding a bicycle. <laughs> the native grabbed his blowhorn and he said, Tch -tch, and shot him twice. And he said, why did you do that? said he was riding my bicycle. I'll tell you the economic policies that's going on in Washington under the present administration. They're riding your bicycle. <laughs> but I don't believe they're going to ride it very long. I just heard on the radio coming out here also that President Ford went out to Oklahoma to s try to save Senator Bellman. Well, he ain't going to save him. But they had a $500 per plate dinner th today, and there wasn't but 56 showed up. They expected 1,000. I believe I could get 56 people in Jackson, Mississippi to come to that big a dinner. <laughs> but what a crying shame it is when the President of the United States can't get but 56 people in the whole state of Oklahoma. But it's a good sign. I agree with George Meany, president of the FFL-CIO, and he said, and I quote, Nixon left the economy in a shambles. And in my book, this country is facing the worst depression since the 1930s. Will a recession or a depression help us? A good senator by the name of Alan Cranston, a good Democrat out in California, he facetiously said this, and I quote, recession isn't completely bad, 
It has allowed every American to live in a more expensive neighborhood without moving. <laughs> Here's what a noted economist said. In essence, the president's message was what we are heading for was that we are heading for the ringer deliberately and voluntarily. And all of us must sacrifice manfully in the national interest. No matter how the wounds and band-aids are distributed, however, a discomforting question remains. Can recession cure inflation? That it can do so is the fundamental assumption of President Ford's economic program. That it cannot do so is the unmistakable lesson of history. For despite recessions in 1954, 1958, 61, 70, and 71, the advance in price level has accelerated, moving from the creeping inflation that plagued President Eisenhower to the extended canter, not quite a gallop, that we have today. One estimate holds that to get inflation down to a 3 or 4% annual increase in prices under present circumstances and by the administration's method would require accepting an unemployment rate of 8% or more. I don't buy it. Now the time comes, what are we going to do? Will we have wage and price controls? According to Victor Rizal, who is certainly not a friend of labor, but he writes a column and here's what he says. He said, before I got an answer to my tell it like it is query, my source, one of Jerry Ford's intimates, usually tense, insisted that in no fashion should I identify him. Then he said, quote, of course the president will reach for wage and price controls. He has to sooner or later. And this means sometimes between Election Day and May Day. But that's the reason all of the prices on cars and steel and gas and utilities go up before labor gets their fair share of the market and their fair share of the increase. And once all of those prices are increased, they'll freeze both wages and labor and prices but only after they have raised their prices sky high and they'll say they're freezing them today before you get any part of a raise that'll make, you, make it possible for you to live a decent life. But in times like these, and I think they're critical, even back during the Hoover days, President Hoover cut his own salary 20%. President Ford has set no such example. And President Franklin Roosevelt, during the economic crisis when he served, he said, I can't leave this capital and go out campaigning. I've got too many problems with the country to leave. But President Ford takes Air Force One and Air Force Two and three or four helicopters and campaigns around all over this nation. But I'm glad he is, because every time he sits down in a city, it costs him Republican votes. <laughs> and I might add at the same time, while all of this, that I think they ought to be cutting salaries and retrenching and setting examples, the congressman added through the back door $9,000 per year expense account to each one of them. You know, the Department of... I have... You know, I have always thought 
that Mississippi was the only state in the Union that didn't have a Department of Labor. Now we have a department for pigs, we have a department for timber, we've got a department for cows, both beef and dairy, we have a department for horses and a department for chickens, but we don't have a department of labor. We're the only state. Well, I got a bill here that I'm introducing to create a department of labor so that you'll be represented. And it's time. What, what will work? Until people like you get a hold of the government. Until people like you be begin to demand ethics in government on the local level and the state level and the national level, we're not going to get anywhere until you begin to open the doors of government and have them to open up in to the, where the public can have a part and see in the press and the media and not do it behind closed doors, you're not going to correct the matter. Until we have financial disclosure laws for all of us and until we have some type of control on the amount of money that somebody can spend to be elected governor or whatever, we're not going to correct it. Where do we correct it? I'll tell you where we correct it. We correct it by people like you going to the ballot box. We correct it by people like you demanding honesty and integrity in government. And if you don't, if you don't, you can read what Lawrence M. Gould said. And he said this. When those, when he was talking about those civilizations that fell, he said there were no bands playing and flags waving when these civilizations decayed. It happened slowly in the quiet and the dark when no one was aware. I know you care. I know for the sake of your children and your grandchildren, you'd better care. We live in a great state. But honesty and integrity in government starts at the local level. As a matter of fact, it starts with me and you. And it starts at the city and the county level and the state level, and then up. It doesn't start down. Use your political influence. Go to the polls and find out who's working for good government and honesty and integrity in government and fairness to the working people of this state. And if you'll do that, we'll have no worries. And I believe you will. Thank you. Very <clears throat> much, Senator Smith, for those very timely and well-stated remarks. You get better every day. The older you get, the better you get. Congratulations. And the prettier I get. And the prettier you get, <laughs> right. We are indeed happy to have you with us this afternoon. I have heard some discussion around that uh, perhaps you might be interested in running for the top office of this state. Uh, somebody told me that you were thinking about this. Uh, I hope maybe you might let us all know here today what your plans were for the future. Have you made that decision yet? I'm going to let the people decide. You're going to let the people decide. Well, it sounds to me like we've got a lot of people here. It looks like they already decided. <laughs> Thank you. Thank Appreciate you. it, Theodore. You're going to be back with us tonight. Yes. Anyway. Yes. I invited the senator to be our special guest tonight. The lieutenant governor will not be here, Senator. <laughs> You're welcome to spend the rest of the afternoon and day with us if you have the time. If you have to leave, we'll understand it. We have some more business we have to get out of the way. I've got to be elected today, you know. I'm, uh, well, I'm for standing you. for election today. You're for me. I'm I, for you. You're for me. Yeah. Good deal. Thank you.
Got a couple of announcements that I should have made. I couldn't, I didn't see how I could hardly interrupt the senator in the middle of his speech. Uh, somebody handed me a card and, uh, card and said uh, some cars, uh, cars out front had to be moved immediately. They were blocking traffic. Well, I thought it was more important to let the senator fish finish his speech than to move those cars. Mine's, out, mine's out there. <laughs> oh, maybe it's yours. <laughs> I'm of the opinion that he's serving in the wrong Senate. I think perhaps we can use him in the U.S. Senate. Now, let me see if I can get some of these announcements out of the way, Brother Knight. I have mentioned a couple of cars. I One, a brown, maroon, and white Pontiac with a rank and tag DMJ447. The owner of that car is here. Uh, we hope the police or the highway patrol hasn't uh, moved it yet for you. Another lime and white Oldsmobile, tag number 065 CDR, Heinz Junior College sticker. Another brown and white 73 or 74 Riviera, tag number DDL 365. That's a couple of more cars that are uh, apparently in the way. I mean, there's something else to that. Where is there's it? Something else involved. All right, before I, before I let you finish that up, I've been asked to uh, thank you on behalf of the Farm Workers Union uh, for tripping in $264.50 a few minutes ago to their cause. Thank you very much. <laughs> Brother Knight wants to make an announcement. Uh, these two of these tag numbers that he gave you, the Rankin County number, and then the last one he gave you are cars blocking employees of the Holiday Inn that have to get out and go home and come back in order to serve the dinner tonight. So if you'd please uh, move those cars. Now, we're having a parking problem here. The hotel didn't get the new parking lot finished until we came in here. The uh, city and the state are hiding behind each other and uh, uh, passing the buck, those people that have gotten tickets, uh, I think maybe that some, I know some how, have uh, been told by the motel to give it to them. We are working on the thing now, and I'm hopeful that we'll get this thing under control somehow till we get out of here tomorrow. Thank you, Brother Knight. I don't think the, I'm not especially wanting to be quoted about this. Uh, in the newspapers. But I think I should advise you the reason we didn't invite the present governor to address this convention centers around the fact that <clears throat> that he allowed the highway patrol to be used in a couple of labor disputes in this state recently, in my opinion. And we just don't feel that a man that allows that type of situation to happen or develop should be invited to appear before our conventions. I just thought you ought to know about that. Thank you. I see you approve of that decision. This time, we're going to recognize the chairman of the Credentials Committee for its final report, Brother Jackson. Come on up. Thank you, Claude. This will be a final report of the Credentials Committee for this convention. We've had represented here 101 local unions 11 central bodies, four statewide associations, and they have sent 279 delegates, 100 guests, for a total of 379 people in attendance at this convention. As chairman of the committee, I move the adoption of the final report and ask for dismissal of the committee with a job well done and the thanks of the convention. Thank you, Brother Jackson. Brother Jackson has moved that those delegates that have been registered now be seated and that his committee be discharged with the thanks of this convention. Motion has been seconded. Ready for the question? All in favor of the motion signified by saying aye. aye. All opposed? 
Motion carried and so ordered. Thank you very much, Brother Jackson, for doing such a good job in such a short period of time. This committee had a tremendous job on their hands trying to get as many people registered as possible Sunday afternoon and Sunday night before Senator Mondale's speech yesterday morning. An excellent job. Brother Fitch, you has advised me that his committee is ready to report. <clears throat> he, don't, he told me, advised me that he thought they could get rid of their report in a period of about three minutes. <clears throat> so I'm going to recognize them in hopes that they can accomplish that before we turn <clears throat> the podium over to the election commit uh, committee. Brother Fitch, you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The, the delegates of the convention recommended that the Constitution and Bylaws Committee go back into session and restudy Section 1 of Article 5 of the Constitution and also Section 1 of Article 7. The Constitution and Bylaws Committee did so and at this time withdraws the recommendation of changes and moves that the Constitution will remain the same for Article 5, Section 1, and Article 7, Section 1 of the Constitution. With this, Mr. Chairman, in words, I move the adoption of this recommendation that the Constitution remain <laughs> as is and ask to be excused with the thanks of the Convention. Very much, <clears throat> Brother Fitzhugh. It did take less than three minutes. You've heard the report of the committee in effect that <clears throat> the Constitution remain as is and that his committee be discharged with the thanks of the Convention. Second, all in favor of that motion signify it by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried and so ordered. Now, before we ask the chairman of the elections committee and his committee to come forward to conduct the election, we've got a couple announcements to make. We will, of course, not reconvene the convention until the election is through. It'll take some time for the committee to call the roll and for you to cast your ballots. We won't be in recess, but we won't reconvene until the night for the banquet. Now, the banquet itself, I understand, is we've been requested by the hotel to delay the banquet until 8 o'clock tonight to give them an opportunity to clear the room and set it up for the banquet. So remember, it'll be 8 instead of 7 in this room. Brother Knight has also asked me to announce that he'd like for the delegates from the 4th Congressional District to meet in the front of this room right after the election's over with. Do we have any other announcements? Any other announcements? Right, Brother Wood, are you, as you and your committee ready? Will the committee please come forward? The committee will call the roll, and as your name or as your local is called, you'll come forward, they'll hand you a ballot with the names of the people running for the executive board and the other offices, You'll mark that ballot, and they'll have a receptacle to put it in, and then we'll ask you to keep moving and clear the room where others can come forward. Those of you who have never been in an election of this kind, that's the way it's worked. We have a number of guests that have registered, that have been in attendance at this convention, I would like very much to recognize each one of you, but as you know, we've been troubled with time. George Sebo in the back, I made your announcement for you earlier, but there he is, the gentleman with all the curly hair with his hand up back there. Mr. George Sebo, if you're interested in going to work for the apprenticeship department or the labor department, there he is, Brother Wood. <clears throat> 